Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for well, coming. Thanks for the interest. Uh, my name is Dusan Milovanovic. Um, and this is the first time uh, that this kind of tutorial will be presented. So thanks for the organizers to give us a chance. Um, and maybe at the end, I will ask you for some comments. We'll have a time for discussion. So um, I'm really curious to, to see you know, what your suggestion will be. This is the first in the series, at least that's the plan for this year. So um, your comments, uh, frank comments will be welcome. Um, so maybe just a few sentences about myself, so you know where I come from. Um, for the last more than five years, I have been engaging uh, in different capacities uh, with World Health Organization in public health intelligence projects, more specifically in developing um, systems for public health intelligence or health intelligence in general. Um, that organization uh, is placed in health emergency program of WHO and uh, it's basic coordinating initiative, which is not WHO initiative, it's really global initiative of communities of communities of health intelligence practice. And I'll, I'll mention what the term means, so bear with me there. Um, before that, I was engaging on a human brain project, uh, well, big European Commission uh, initiative. Uh, yeah, I almost forgot currently, I'm also an expert consultant for health intelligence on uh, European Commission's uh, Athena project uh, owned by HERA agency. Um, and so this is my engagement in health uh, since 2016. Before that, I was um, computer, I'm, I'm still computer scientist and telecom engineer. I was in, I was in Ericsson for good 16 years uh, in search and development, starting 3G on. So yeah, I'm electric engineer and yeah, computer science and telecommunications background. Um, so this is, this is about me. Um, just before we start practically going through the details, uh, this tutorial is, as I said, the first of the kind, and I had a difficult time figuring out, you know, what is the right way to go through all these details. There is a lot here, so I would propose that you interrupt me at any time. There is a Slack channel for, for people uh, online, if there's anyone online. Um, so it's better to be clear than me talking too much is because there, there will be a lot of, lot of talks. Um, I could not fit in practical stuff, uh, but I, I suggest that we take this as a, as, as a practical tutorial. First thing is, um, uh, it's, it's still tutorial in my opinion, although we'll talk about things that nobody is yet doing. Or I will mention who started talking about that back in 2011 and who wants to do it, but we're still not there. I mentioned some projects I was in, so actually that's where, where this uh, is supposed to start. But it's tutorial in, in terms of suggesting, you know, what is the right way to address the gaps and needs in, in health in general. Uh, I will mention the health care, so individual health um, case, but actually it's, it's the same, same problem and the same gaps in, in, a, in the population health anyway. Um, so the practical side is a case, the real, real life case uh, and of course the solution side which is a third part in the middle it's more discussion about different concepts that might be the right approach towards you know filling these gaps and fulfilling the needs so without further ado just uh, some housekeeping information um So first part is a case study. It, it is 20 years long course of illness. Second part, the uh, role of health intelligence. And third part, um, actually the solution to tackle information interoperability problem. And then we'll have some time for discussions and, and some closing remarks from me. So here with the case study, the plan is to um, talk about or present diagnostic challenges, um, breakthrough, life-saving treatment, recovery, at least transient, and continuing challenges. So basically the idea is really to, to illustrate a real life case, not this generic one size fits all, this is a solution, we have a model, here is a fire, here is a loing, here is SNOMED, here is ICD, and we'll sort out everything. It's really to look at the case and then think, you know, where are the gaps, what we need to do. So that's, that's why the case itself. 
Um, and then um, I'm here implying with the name, the role of health intelligence. So there is, there is something that, that we need to think about. Um, and within health intelligence, of course, all these, all these different concepts we're talking about to take place, but actually we need to understand what health intelligence discipline is and how that helps to fill the gap that remains unfilled for too long now. And then more technical, if you want more engineering uh, information in part three, why? Because we do have also technology gap that we need to fill, and then we'll talk. Uh, and please be interactive. And then just um, last housekeeping information. I mean, we're a little bit late, but I think I uh, will we'll catch up. I think there is enough space here. So I'll try not to spend more than 25, 30 minutes, not to bore you to death with the case. Um, but the idea is to give you an idea how this complicated this was and or still is and you know all these different dots that needs to be connected and some misdiagnoses and and then we start talking about health intelligence then to take a coffee break and by the way if you want to change this i'm perfectly okay uh, if we need more than one coffee break uh, we continue with this role of health intelligence and then we talk about um, information through really till uh, at the end for about an hour and the last half an hour we can use to have some open discussions and again please let's make it interactive it's it's easier that way i think for everyone okay uh is there any questions on, on this housekeeping stuff and all right let's go then so i already mentioned just in summary this should be takeaways from from today um, understanding of the role of knowledge representation and reasoning and uh, network analysis or use of graph algorithms for network analysis so all three if you want in assisting of course for the practical reason assisting petitioners and patients um, to to discover to forecast diseases and also to make uh, the best decisions um, then understanding of the scope and the role of health intelligence discipline. Um, I'll tell you why I think the name is, is good, actually. And it's also good because we have the term, but actually we don't have health intelligence globally. From the local level to the global level, you choose it, you pick and choose, there is nothing. And then um, identification of information interoperability problem. So they define the problem and then propose a solution for it. So this, this would be three takeaways from, from this tutorial. And why tutorial? Because again, it, it goes into, you know, uh, proposing to use this or why using this, what is, what is the right way to go and approach, basically uh, fill the, this big gap in, in making best decisions based on incomplete information, which, is, which will remain in healthcare and life science in general. Okay, so part one case study. I will sit down. So the plan, the plan here is to talk about um, that specific patient. Uh, we'll start with diagnostic challenges. If I speak too fast and if you're interested, please interrupt me and, and ask questions again. I'll, I'll try to go. I don't know what's your interest here. So, you know, it's I'll, 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 I won't make it too medical, but, but we, need to, we need to identify uh, most important things. Um, so challenges, then how we came up to the breakthrough, life-saving treatment recovery, and then continuing challenges after that as well. So that child was born in 2002, um, and there was nothing... Um, remarkable during pregnancy of child's mother it's it's a little it was a little girl and otherwise no problems you know during during the during birth um, first two years of life perfect um, regular vaccination uh, including uh, mmr vaccine which was the topic at the time in 2003 in uk and uh, the child was born in ireland so uh, despite that i mean everything everything done according to protocols uh, Perfectly healthy, fast development, mental, physical, even at the time of onset of illness when she was two years old, she was probably in the level of three-year-old, mentally, physically, the first child in the family, you know, <laughs> all the attention to her, a lot of videos, 
which helped later on to discover things that were not immediately visible. Uh, two weeks before the onset of illness, which was exactly one month after second birthday, um, she had a respiratory infection and an actual big, probably first stress in life because, um, and by the way, there is a consent for this and I'll tell you the secret at the end. Uh, but there is all that I'm telling, that telling you guys, uh, there is a consent to, to share uh, by both parents. So uh, she had the first probably stress in her life because uh, she started going to kindergarten <laughs> um, and she got some respiratory infection. Maybe it's remarkable, maybe not. Um, but that's that's the only remarkable thing uh, before everything started. And then there was an onset of illness. And for those who are not medical, uh, paroxysmal symptoms are, you know, um, occasional tachycardia, so fear, gulping, uh, some autonomous nervous system kind of a reaction, epigastric pain, meaning mean pain in, in esophagus, in, 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 in the upper part of abdomen spasmodic stomach movements like uh, and vomiting, uh, occasional vomiting. So it perfectly healthy, basically nothing before and then all of a sudden every day, multiple times a day, especially before sleep. And then she became gradually weaker, significantly reduced physical activity, uh, being uh, asking parents not to, to go away from the playground because when children jump, she could not look at this asking parents to stop children jumping, things like that. So big change overnight. Uh, and then, you know, we go around, discover some urinary tract infection. Again, uh, of course, sinus tachycardia was diagnosed, uh, low grade chest infection, uh, hypercalciuria, swallies, you know, periphery things that, that uh, we didn't know their periphery, uh, but these were first diagnoses. And I'll try to fast forward, obviously, <laughs> we're talking about 20 years here. Um, and this is again, still first year. Um, May to December, this is first, uh, how many, six, seven, eight months of, uh, of illness. Uh, she had, she started developing extremely frequent vomiting. Um, sometimes uh, clusters of like uh, vomiting every 10 minutes. Again, same symptoms, uh, complaining on the pain uh, in, in the epigastric area, complaining on uh, seemingly fear for no reason at home, uh, asking to be comforted, uh, conscious, but that was, these were the symptoms. Uh, neurological, clinical neurological exams were perfectly okay. Again, she was overdeveloped for her age. And then, you know, um, in September, uh, you can sit here in the, the slides, um, she developed first three in the hospital, first three after, after a cluster of frequent vomiting as we, as, as, as parents, okay, I told you a secret now, as parents uh, saw it, um, um, it was a cluster of, of these epigastric symptoms and uh, in, in the hospital she, uh, she had the first three um, uh, obvious epileptic seizures with loss of conscience. Then CT, MRI uh, appeared normal, MRI was done later in November. Um, of course, electroencephalogram revealed multiple focuses actually, which was then strange, why multiple and what is going on really. Uh, still not conclusive diagnosis of epilepsy. Epileptic seizure is one thing, and I will come back to that in the second part of the terminology. A seizure is one thing, epilepsy is something else, and then epilepsy syndrome is the third thing that now we clarified or since 2017. Uh, International League Against Epilepsy clarified the terminology before that, during the time, this time it was the old classification that actually I think helped uh, not diagnosing or or missing diagnosis for quite a long. So again, terminology is really important and I'll come back to that, that point uh, later. Um, again, there was a suspected unconfirmed viral infections. It was really a puzzle case. She was called a puzzle case back in Children's National Children's Hospital in Dublin and uh, different doctors had different opinions. Um, clusters of paroxysmal symptoms, vomiting, etc., were later confirmed as manifestation of epileptic seizures. Uh, 
it was not obvious to almost all doctors uh, at the time. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I listed here some points that will help help me pointing towards terminology and towards, you know, connecting the dots and why these different um, concepts we're talking about here, knowledge representation, reasoning, network analysis, using graph analytics, uh, ontologies um, come together uh, and, and how they might help experts by automating or discovering some patterns that otherwise would take a lot of time experts to discover. So again, that's why I mentioned Jabergic um, uh, anti-seizure medication stopped seizure clusters at the beginning, every time, uh, even, even today. Um, otherwise, that was a drug-resistant intractable epilepsy, not a single uh, anti-epileptic drug, as was the old name that was now removed. Now they call it anti-seizure drugs. Again, terminology matters for better communication between experts who might not be neurologists and not also between patients and experts. So then, then you know, you can exchange information timely and relevant information without confusion and, and going towards, towards um, uh, root cause. Um, and uh, this is very interesting. She uh, started developing early onset diabetes type 1 at the same time. Obviously, when all this got hell, hell broke loose, um, a lot of different specialties engaged uh, and uh, full metabolic workup was done. Uh, muscle biopsy, uh, small, small muscle from the hip was taken, et cetera, et cetera. So, so basically all these different things were done. And the full metabolic workup showed nothing like everything else, actually. Many, many other things like, for example, full exome sequencing, I won't mention here. Uh, shows nothing. I don't know. I uh, uh, was one of these 12 Swedish guys who were <laughs> taking as a template genome. <laughs> Father wasn't. But, but it was really, really puzzling case, really. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to discover anything using the usual so-called differential diagnosing the old-fashioned medical ways and, you know, thinking about um, rare or not so rare uh, ways and trying to connect the dots uh, in, in experts' heads. Right. So before coming to, to the breakthrough, a few more information that uh, should paint the, um, the picture. So there are some misdiagnoses as well. Uh, again, I mentioned unsuspect, uh, suspected but unconfirmed, never confirmed viral um, um, infection was treated with antiviral medication. Actually, at the beginning, when she got antiviral medication, she would she would not even have these seizures or, or felt much better than, than when they stopped. Then she goes back to having this vomiting and, and symptoms. So it was really strange. And then because of vomiting, eventually in, in, in that hospital, they, they um, diagnosed her with gastroesophageal reflux disorder and um, surgery was scheduled. And then 15 minutes before surgery, uh, parents stopped because it didn't add up. Simply didn't. She was physically developed. There was no reason to believe. And, and just doing a surgery to stitch the, the sphincter here. And when she was two years old, when she was four, uh, parents asked what happens. So we stitch again. Doesn't, doesn't add up. And again, as a parent, you need to make a decision, but then you have no idea. Parents were not doctors, so are you, is that good? Are you harming your child? Or, so that's, that's how it really looks like. Uh, if, if you think this is, this is severe, it is. But if you think that's very rare, then you think about 10% of population in our countries here where statistics exist. So this so-called rare or complex illness is, is around 10% of population. So you will hear every 10th person has some story, probably here in the room as well. Um, I mean, statistically speaking, so, so um, it's, it's, it's not that rare. I mean, again, not the same problem, but these complex illnesses that are diagnosed after a long time and the suffering and all these misdiagnoses uh, is, is out there. 
And then we don't know even today because, as you know, things are not connected. Things, things are compartment information is compartmentalized. Uh, it's in the format that is not easily shareable and findable, and all 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 the other stuff that we'll tackle here as as a problem, and try to propose a solution. So. Um, as I said, diagnosis, epilepsy it was diagnosed and it was obvious. Uh, so seizure is seizure. It can be one seizure, like sometimes small kids, babies would have these febrile seizures. So it's one seizure, one, you know, misfiring of the brain, but just one. But when you have more than one in sequence, then that becomes um, uh, uh, an epilepsy as a condition. Um, but you know, uh, at the time that old old name cryptogenic, uh, which if so I remember well, means um, there is a suspected cause, probably genetic or at the time metabolic, uh, but we don't know. We haven't discovered it. Uh, was was on the table, um, and onset of of diabetes to repeat again was seemingly at the same time as onset to epilepsy. So I, I hope, you know, that the purpose of all these details is just to paint a picture saying, okay, it's difficult. It's obviously the full attention to the kid in this hospital. You know, I, I, we, maybe there was another kid similar, we don't know, but the full attention was there. Um, metabolic workup was done all around Europe um, and, and still completely puzzling. Uh, and, and the idea is just to say it's complex. And so, what do we do? So the parents were active. This this uh, type of active parents, which are trying to write, uh, and it was it was it was um, paper-based re medical records at the time. So you would take handwritten blood glucose measurements and then put in a Excel in a graph, and uh, you will write the duration of the seizure and write all these different self-observation information and try to help doctors to help you basically with providing information or even analyzing later on when it starts piling up. So um, in that, in that uh, uh, long, long road, uh, which is still ongoing, um, parents consulted globally. Worldwide, uh, if you if you name the expert when it comes to um, immunology, you know, neuroimmunology, epileptology, diabetology, endocrinology, so cross Atlantic, U.S., Canada, and Europe, even even more. But it seems seemingly, uh, you know, the knowledge uh, at the time was concentrating cross Atlantic. That at least that was that was experience of the parents. So uh, in these discussions, one, and this is, this is now important for my point, uh, in these discussions, one, ep one the diabetologist um, uh, who was accidental in the room with another doctor asked uh, parents uh, whether uh, the tests to anti-glutamic acid decarboxylase autoantibodies were done. Uh, when asked why, he said, well, uh, in literature, around 15% of kids who are developing type 1 diabetes have these autoantibodies in, in blood. Uh, but there is no known clinical utility. Like, the question was, what's the clinical utility of that? Well, none, probably, so it was left with that. But again, you know, if you have no idea what your etiology is. It's an active uh, illness, uh, you know, neurodegenerative disorders start kicking in. Child was even, you know, regressing. Uh, it was... Uh, basically a search for, for these missing puzzles. And so um, there was a lot of reading. Uh, Google doesn't help. Uh, Facebook existed at the time, but Facebook also doesn't help much because people, parents, uh, tend to, people share positive things. Uh, not so much negative things. So you have no idea really uh, you know, you, you can you can get a lot of information about something's working, but after some time when it doesn't work, you don't have information. So it's it's biased. It's biased basically. So so the literature that was uh, proven useful was obviously Medline and PubMed was was a bible. So you check all that, then you pay for some 
full text articles <laughs> when 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 you need to pay because you know some um, some are not available uh, in an open way at the time not so much open um, and there was no mentions of similar symptoms and similar age and kids and anti anti glutamic acid carboxylase onto antibodies and neurological problems and epilepsy and development of type one diabetes so that could not be found except for one kid, but he didn't have a diabetes in San Francisco. Um, but there's a lot of uh, connection or correlation between reported anti glutamic acid carboxylic disease and stiff person syndrome in adults. So neurological was there. And, um, and so you can translate in your head now, take now so, so performant large language models and, you know, do uh, try to discover pattern in uh, in in internet uh, scale text. Uh, you know they're optimized to internet scale text, and uh, even now you can't find it. Don't have time today on the tutorial. That was my ambition, but I think workshop is needed for for that practical one. Um, uh, still, it's difficult to find. Um, and um, but what was possible to find manually was now reading textbooks. So. Because metabol uh, metabolome was suspected, all these metabolic cycles and Krebs cycles and whatnot, not only Krebs, but also some some other other um, biochemical um, processes in the in the body, and in textbooks you can find that um, very quickly actually that uh, glutamic acid carboxylase is a coenzyme in synthesis of gamma aminobutyric acid, which is inhib important inhibitory neurotransmitter from glutamic acid. Um, and so in, in very simple one chemical reaction, like uh, glutamate uh, with uh, this decarboxylase, decarboxylation of glutamate, thanks to decarboxylase, uh, gives gamma aminobutyric acid and um, um, CO2. So, so this was now seemingly some piece of puzzle, something to connect. And um, in addition, a child did react to GABAergic medication. So maybe, you know, this medication is replacing um, um, the loss of gamma aminobutyric acid, maybe because of, maybe again, we did not know what happens in the brain, whether antiglutamic acid carboxylase is in the brain or, or in, the, in the blood. So then, um, then what happened was the following. Uh, there was a reluctance uh, in, in so many different places uh, and the top university hospitals to do anti-GED um, serum workup, although it was very cheap test, I think in Switzerland and Zurich, it's 27 Swiss francs, I think. So it's nothing, it's not a price. It's more like it's not a protocol and, you know, people have different opinions uh, and there was nothing in the literature really. And so uh, parents found one private lab in Serbia and Belgrade who uh, wanted to order the test. And so this, this was, it's small there, but, uh, you know, this red line is, I mean, normally we, we have zero. There is no nothing in, in the blood up to 10. Uh, according to literature and some statistics, it uh, does not uh, do much difference. Above 10 or around 10 were reported these kids who developed type, type 1 diabetes. Why type 1 diabetes and anti-GD? Um, glutamic acid carboxylase is also coenzyme in um, beta cells in production of insulin and pancreas. So. So they, they, these are these are the dots that are connected. Seemingly, you know, you you have no idea. And so um, the titer was huge. It's like these hundreds of uh, international units per millimole, uh, uniformly each month. So this is month by month uh, measurements. Um, and then the question is, okay, what happens with the immune system of the brain? Can can we do anti GED from the serum, from from the um, liquor, from the uh, cerebrospinal fluid? And uh, that also took some time, further years. So see, there was a three years there, trying to you know do something or learn more. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there was not much in the literature still. Uh, as the parents were active, so you can see there. It's small, but again, you can imagine, you know, these are number of seizures, the frequency of the seizures a day. And, you know, there's a seizure 
uh, manifestation of the seizure, seizure duration, and what you can't see there, but you know, as you see, it's low at certain point of time. What's happened every single time is that kids, uh, the only anti-epileptic drug was fever uh, caused by viral infection or probably viral. So when, when the opposite from what's written in the literature, so when she has a high fever, she doesn't have seizures. That's another puzzling thing. And again, this was shared with virtually everyone relevant known globally, from West Coast US to Germany, Sweden, Serbia. So that's, that's what it is. And then um, last but not least, um, uh, diagnostic challenges. Um, so I'll stop bothering you with this story. Um, gradual and significant deterioration, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, during these three years, progressive neurodegenerative disorder, uh, generalized brain atrophy, uh, decrease, so developmental delay, then decline. Um, uh, and then it developed into 60 seizures a day, basically no sleep, nothing. So she was, she was going out. Uh, I, I would like to put in brackets one thing. Um, and um, that was just recently discovered thanks to some portal of uh, parents from US who put a portal called, and I have a link here, autoimmune encephalopathy. Uh, so these autoantibodies and this uh, autoimmune disorder is now known. And this one is really causing these big problems and even worse than, than this kid. So, so there is you know, and, and then the, the prevalence of this or the incidence of, of, of that one. So statistics doesn't doesn't talk much about it. It's it's but then again it's both adults and children. So again, the system is not there and not paying attention too much to, to this particular obviously rare disease by definition a rare disease. Um, so parents being active, going around, and uh, I, I, I spare you from these details, they're not important for for connecting the dots uh, and for, for this tutorial, but eventually in Geneva, um, in one center, the whole diagnostic is confirmed after consultations um, globally. Uh, so again, uh, experts were connected through parents. So they communicated through parents. Uh, and then uh, there also uh, diffuse hypometabolism of glucose was confirmed in PET scan so that talks about there is no focal, there is no morphological problem in the brain. It's probably some biochemical problem. Again, we, um, uh, we're talking here about this uh, autoimmune disorder. And, and again, parents were asking if, you know, that can be confirmed, not peripheral in the brain, in, in the blood, but, you know, what's, what's the story in cerebrospinal fluid, what's in the brain? And, 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 you know, anti-glutamic acid carboxylase is, is, is a large peptide. It's a macromolecule, so it should not pass blood-brain barrier normally. So eventually in Lyon, in one, one lab, uh, the, the test was done and uh, you saw hundreds, I think it was 10,000 international units per millimole, so huge, like a couple of orders of magnitude, so larger concentration of the same autoantibodies were found in the brain. So that was catastrophic, completely catastrophic. It was not reported like that anywhere. And so, um, and to focus on epilepsy because uh, that was the obvious thing and uh, the most difficult of all symptoms. Um, it was multifocal, so diffuse and different seizure types. Uh, so the parents identify five, uh, sharing with other carers and uh, Grandparents, whoever is along with child, if something happens, then they, they write one of the files, letter A, B, C, D, for them to remember easily. Um, so this is, this is the challenge, diagnostic challenges. And then, you know, because um, uh, of all this autoimmune disorder found and all this uh, uh, big, big problem in the brain, um, uh, an aggressive treatment, which was plasma pheresis, was done for, for those who don't know. This is, it looks like dialysis. It's actually, you, you get the catheter surgically <coughs> almost down to the heart. And then you have a machine which looks like the dialysis machine. She's basically filtering out macromolecules from, from your serum, giving you, replacing serum with some donor serum. So it's pretty, pretty difficult. <coughs> but after the first one, 
uh, child who was not talking anymore, who was in the bed, stood up in, in the intensive care uh, where, where the therapy was done, started talking. Um, she was back better than, than years ago, um, going up the slide in the playground just after the first one. It was frequent, I think, uh, every three or four weeks, uh, repeated for two and a half years. And I stopped because, you know, there was no further improvement and this is really difficult in evasive, evasive therapy. But remarkable results made everybody want to continue to see what happens. So this temporary physical removal of autoantibodies uh, caused, I mean, was correlated with big improvements. So the guess was that there must be something they're causing at least some problems, if, if not being a cause of, of these obvious neurological problems, at least they're causing something. So this is, this is basically what, what plasma phoresis treatment done. There was steroids before that that didn't work. There was some rituximab and other usual stuff that was done afterwards, but it also didn't work. Can plasma phoresis stop working after some time as well? Uh, she was going to special school, difficulty learning. I mean, it's, it's obvious for these parents, uh, for, for those who know, for those who don't, I'll say um, they, these, these patients are, are uh, having, uh, the first thing is hypocampus uh, atrophy, uh, bilateral atrophy of hypocampus. And then in this case, it was generalized atrophy, gray and white matter, I mean, completely generalized. Um, so, uh, What's known now, because there is now hundreds of, of articles and case reports about patients, uh, both adults and children, with these, um, auto, this kind of autoimmune disorder, um, all of them have general weakness, develop general weakness, ataxia, cerebellum is, is attacked, and, and so um, that's, that's, that was the case with her. Again, we did not know, there was no publications at that time. And then um, uh, their doctor uh, in, in University Hospital in Geneva published in Archives of Neurology in 2011 this paper on this, this bigger one. Um, this smaller one is actually a never published paper written by parents. So, so there was a big file, PDF tables extracted from uh, paper-based records all over the place and self-observations and everything from before birth you know, shared, shared with doctors all over the place. And that was not readable easily. So, so there was a summary um, that I actually used to, to summarize these things as well now. So that summary or, or these things are basically summarized even more in, in, in this paper that was published in Archives of Neurology. You can still find references today to that paper. Uh, but then um, fast forward years after, maybe five, six, seven years after, there was a lot of publications about that. Unfortunately for that kid and this, this situation, there was nothing at the time. Um, and I think this is also important. There was nothing at the time. And then you need to go through all these things for how many years uh, since onset? Seven years. Uh, and so that was nice breakthrough recovery, but then challenges continued. Um, there was a worsening, one significant worsening, um, like every couple of minutes, a cluster of, of seizures, almost status epilepticals. She was put on phenobarbital, and um, after that, uh, even uh, bigger weakness. Uh, after that, she could have never, until today, walk without support. Um, still up, up to date, vomiting with seizures. Um, after uh, going into puberty for some unknown reason, uh, she doesn't have any autoantibodies in her blood. Cerebrospinal fluid is not tested. Um, this is also important for understanding the system and later on the solution that I would like to discuss with you and talk about <laughs> and, and, and propose in the form of tutorial, this is what we should do. Um, uh, but she had last consultation with neurologists two, year, two and a half years ago. Uh, between that time and now, she had around 15,000 epilepsy seizures. Um, so this is how the system works, because actually, again, there's no protocol. Uh, you cannot blame doctors. I, I don't think that, uh, you know, you need to find a better expert. Um, it's a problem with the system. And, and that's, that's a big problem. <laughs> who, who can change the system? So, um, 
you know, consultations are ad hoc. There is no, I'll, I'll mention that as a part of the solution. Actually, that can be side effect of the solution that we can talk about. Imagine that somehow this information, self-observations, how do we know it's 15,000? Because parents are keeping tabs on the seizures. So how do we, can we make, can we make this information available in real time or near real time? to experts, you know, or maybe some information system or software that can raise the alarm that, you know, you need to see that, that kid or this, this person because that person reports constantly um, uh, problems that are not, not solved. Uh, there is no point seeing neurologists because there is not a single so-called anti-epileptic or anti-seizure drug that has not been tried, nothing works. Um, two remaining stuff was vagus nerve stimulator. It won't work as well. Uh, it's also invasive. Um, but you know, uh, the last consultation with the neurologist was what was proposed by the neurologist in Swiss Romont, which is uh, cross Lake Geneva uh, or Lac Le Mans between Lausanne University Hospital and Geneva University Hospital. The only remaining thing was corpus callostomy, so to divide the two hemispheres surgically and to at least minimize the number of generalized seizures. But in discussions that were similar, like this operation of esophagus, this will probably get this kid who anyway has difficulties um, even worse, maybe losing her. Um, and so, uh, and then the number of seizures that will go down after analyzing the types of seizures, thanks to self-observations, um, uh, was, was minimal. So uh, the, my point here is again uh, with all this information giving and trying to make the point so there is information about the seizures and types of seizures and this information is used for um, fine-tuning the treatment and for diagnostics so what patients or in this case parents of patients parents of patients are doing is actually the most important information that information for the last 20 years has found no place in any of the medical records from the paper based back in Dublin um, until this electronic health record, uh, a nice one in University Hospital Geneva, except in the city Rome, like all these things in electronic form is put somewhere. But so if you want to use fires and moings and, and snowman CTs and ICD 9 of the world and connect patient data, there's so many things. And for diabetes, since that patient has diabetes as well, as, as you know, uh, it's self-observations all the time. You go and visit your diabetologist to report on, on your self-observations and based on that, you know, everything is done. So, so do we have this information available? No, not at all. So, so that's, that's basically uh, what, what has happened and continuing challenges. So, you know, there was some transient, uh, probably life-saving treatment that men, when she's still around, but yeah, um, th this is just illustrations. So you can see this is year by year. So it's, it's every day, uh, very, in very disciplined way, seizures are registered. It's on a good day, dozen, around dozen seizures of different types. Uh, so this is a uh, here moving average uh, day by day, um, number of seizures, um, some therapy there just to see whether it makes a difference because it's usually if she feels better and then goes back to normal or maybe she doesn't feel better but parents have a feeling they feel, they feel better all these biases are built in. And this is uh, daily seizures, number of daily seizures per hour in the day over the course of a couple of years. So all this information shared, this is, I think, Tableau. All this information tried to be shared with experts, um, tried to engage with medical informatics departments in all these different uh, towns and cities and countries, uh, completely unsuccessfully. Um, I'll come to the point, there is no chance to have health intelligence or any intelligence without interdisciplinary approach. There's no interdisciplinary approach, no, no interdisciplinarity in organization in, in health in general. I can vouch for global level WHO, where I spent last five years. It's so painful. <laughs> um, I parachuted myself from the sky and that goes down to the hospital level as well. So that's, that's something that requires resolution, unfortunately. So as any other problem, unfortunately, it's, it's not only technical. There's so many 
reasons and so many gaps that needs to be filled and some cannot be filled only using technical means, um, information communication technologies and some other type of science. Uh, social science and humanities and, and needs to be involved as well, I think. Um, so this is the last, last uh, in the story finally. Uh, and this was longer than 30 minutes, but but we'll we'll then save time on 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 the later stuff. So I I I would not remember probably a thing that 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 I told you, but that's not the point. The point is that I'll, I'll come back to some of these points in, in the solution, and and in discussing you know uh, what seemed to be optimal way of you know addressing these gaps and needs. Uh, so I'll remind you, but if you have a feeling or intuition that it's it's complex and basically nobody can solve it this this way, how we how we practice um, healthcare in general today, uh, then then that's I think good enough. Um, again, um, this is basically transition towards talking about um, what we can do or should do what seems optimal way. So I mentioned several times, but just to, to, to repeat once again, since 2007, when parents wrote the case report and shared with, with Worldwide, and, and before that even detailed data, but this case report that was easy to read was shared. Um, there was hundreds, um, after 2011, maybe hundreds of reports um, that you can find uh, even now if you search just through Medline. Um, but there's still no protocol for disorder, uh, and that's true for many hospitals around Europe. Uh, you will not see that this disorder exists in, in, in um, uh, oh my goodness, my, my brain stopped now. This database of rare diseases, you will not find it, strangely, although there is hundreds of, of reports. So that's a testament of you know how we as people are slow when we sit down and we need to agree and we need to prove and we need to meet and so this seem seemingly is not the solution. You see the number of years that has passed. It's it's twenty years. It's not twenty days. Twenty weeks. Twenty months. It's twenty years. Um, and um, International League Against Epilepsy published in two thousand thirteen a new classification that if we would have had this before most probably at least, you know, it would be diagnosed much earlier. Because now it's really, really clear. I mean, all these different symptoms I mentioned are actually, as you will see in the next part, um, there in the new, uh, as I like to call it, ontology, because uh, the, the new classification of diseases is not just classific uh, new classification of seizures, it's not just classification of seizures, knowledge models, as you will see soon enough uh, in the next part. Um, so it really helps. Unfortunately, it was not there. Um, in 2022, they acknowledged on their website, just in 2022, that there is that um, immunity as, as potential cause for some epileptic syndromes. And so at least now, you know, doctors could have an idea as opposed to before. Um, but just to tell you, uh, in 1998, there was a report that uh, that I found uh, that was published somewhere that International League against epilepsy started working on your classification. They managed to have it in 2013, so it's 15 years. So it was like uh, three years, four years before this, no, six years before this kid started having onset uh, of, of the epilepsy illness. And then only like next nine years after um, they, they have this great classification, at least to, to my opinion or even knowledge model, really, ontology. So this is really slow. Uh, if, if we think about this as a solution, we need to think twice. And again, the point here being, I'll come back to that later <laughs> when we talk about solution. Um, if we talk about healthcare, uh, it started as private relationship of trust between patients and their, their carers, physicians, nurses, and whatnot. And now it evolved into uh, really complex mechanism. We never lived longer than today. Uh, we were never healthier in general, generally speaking, than, than, than today. But um, now the patient is small, 
no one coming through a revolving, big revolving drawer in the big, big hospital to the reception desk and going to the small person called physician in the small room who is under huge pressure, especially in university hospitals, doing you know, academia, doing research, publish or perish is still a principle, and then having patients. So the whole system now, because it became very complex, is now optimized for charging and billing. And um, what I learned in WHO, it is true. Uh, now it's getting optimal for maximizing power and profit and very suboptimal for um, supporting private relationship of trust between poor physicians or carers and poor patients. And you will hear that from carers as well. I saw it from the both sides as uh, as a uh, uh, patient, but also as, as a colleague of these people since I started uh, working with them fully professionally in 2016. So what can we do? That's the question. But but we, before before I go into, into the next, hopefully more interesting topic and easy to, well, hopefully easy to remember, <laughs> it's, it's our topic. Uh, do you have any questions? Is there anything? Yes. Um, you said that in the last and um, in the other slide, what is the acronym stand for? Email? International League Against Epilepsy. It's an organization uh, uh, of experts uh, who are coming together to try to tackle these problems of, of diagnosis and of course classification um, and treatment and all that and they're giving recommendations uh, to, to the healthcare practitioners to do those things you. you're welcome and by, by the way um, at the same time leaving these things um, uh, one year before the onset of, of this girl's illness uh, the term digital health was coined uh, thanks to uh, big investment, 13 billion pounds uh, of national health, national health system of uh, UK during the Tony Blair's government. And then the same year, George Bush managed to get through Congress 30, 30 billion dollars for electronic health records around US. So then all my colleagues, computer scientists, engineers, open startups, there's the money. There is digital health, like there is an analog health. I haven't heard about analog health. Then um, one of the things I managed to do in WHO, which means nothing changes, nothing is people are not using digital anymore. No, not to everyone, but at least these guys around me, all the way to the top, they, they realize digital doesn't make any sense. Then it was healthcare industry. It's not an industry. It's private relation of trust between patient and doctors. If you industrialize this and, and put financial or economic, uh, you know, objective on the top or or if you concentrate fully on that it's important because it's a complex system uh, you, you cannot minimize that but the core is forgotten because doctors don't have money patients are paying through charging and billing right and then uh, snowmed cities of the world and icds from my who um, uh, have just enough um, definitions and they are classifications only just enough definitions for charging and billing. So you, you still don't have anything in ICD-11 or SNOMED CT, despite the definition, new definitions, new classification of epilepsy, it's not supported by SNOMED CT and ICD-9, 10, 11. Um, it was 2013. So this is how slow it is. So um, Robert Jacobs, ICD team from WHO, uh, is doing great work. He's, he thinks the same as, as many of us do, and he knows the same as we do about the importance of terminology and, and you know, the definitions. And, and, um, um, but you cannot centralize the global body of knowledge. So solution, we need to find different solutions. So can we? This tutorial is about proposing one. Is there any more questions on, on the case or in general about the system itself before we go into solution side? Did, did you want to ask? Hi. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you wanted to. Uh, I, th I think you need to turn on the mic. mic. 
Thank you at all. John, oh, oh. Okay. Oh, thank you. And uh, I have a question. So, even though that uh, symptoms or disease she had it already known, why it's not new at the time? So, why the uh, doctor didn't uh, find any uh, no, di diagnosis before that? And symptom found so, because it's not a new disease, right? It was already known in the world, some somewhere in the hospitals, but it's very difficult to diagnose that, that symptom. So, w what's the reason why uh, doctor didn't find any good solutions for that symptom? Yeah. So, so. Um, I, I, I believe I believe the task series is um, so as lies in your question the, it's true what, what you have with most of the patients are size and symptoms you start with that and then based on um, other contextual information you get from patients that's why this relation private relation with trust is important uh, you as an expert is trying to discover the path to 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 get more information and, and come close to diagnosis. Um, uh, symptoms were common for so many things. Um, uh, that autoimmune encephalitis was not that known before. And yes, there was no known patient diagnosed, uh, at least not in the, it was not in the literature. So they could not find it in literature. It's rare enough that they haven't seen it before. Um, they even said, uh, when they did not know what to do in Dublin, they said, let's wait, maybe it will just pass by itself. So, so symptoms were, were not enough to discover. It was complex enough. And then I think that there's one part of the answer to that that I believe, and that's my opinion. Uh, they don't have time. These parents had one patient, that one kid, the first kid. So they were just, you know, going after and reading and collecting information about that one. I mean, even if you increase capacity and have 10 times more doctors, they will still not have time to read all that. They have other patients, they have other things to do. So it's not possible to just, you know, by reading and, and connecting the dots that way in pretty, ma pretty much manual way without um, uh, some more, you know, a automated ways to discover patras or to connect structured information. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. So I think that's, that's the reason. Symptoms are more misleading, uh, not much published in literature and uh, no time to spend on one patient. So, so one of the things about the system was how about, so I was saying, we in Ericsson at the time, we had this, this tiger teams or task forces for important problems in important parts of the world, like Hong Kong network is dying and you have a task force. Um, uh, so I was challenging them, I said, okay, how about having task force in the hospitals for these kind of people who, who really have a serious problems, at least for kids. Again, this is how system works, and I think it's it's really really difficult to 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 discover, and that's why probably rare so-called rare diseases or complex illnesses are taking so long, in average, to to reach to some conclusive diagnosis. Like there's some information about seven to fourteen years of average time before diagnosis since onset, which is huge. By the way, this rare illness is for people who want to think about healthcare as an industry who, who still care about financial. Uh, the, the proof that they don't care about financial, it's only power probably, less profit or a different kind of profit, not financial. Uh, between 80 and 90 percent of he annual healthcare cost goes to 10 percent of patients, these, these people. Like we are occasionally there, but, but these 10 percent of people spend the whole annual healthcare cost in all these countries where statistics exist. It's very easy to find, actually. So, so this is this is actually how how the whole system works, and it's not possible through these mechanisms that we have to discover more. So maybe we we reach this ceiling, you know, glass glass ceiling. You know, there's so much details discovered, but now to connect these dots and discover how they connect in one person or small group of people is is now increasingly difficult, and we don't have solution for that yet. And since I joined WHO, actually, I, that's the first time. I heard the term, health intelligence, and now I like it. It's the best term ever for me. I'll try to argue why. Uh, I think it demystifies a lot and it reveals 
<laughs> what we don't have and what we need to do. Uh, and it's quite a popular term nowadays um, in, in very strange ways. Again, I, I, I wanted to tell you at the end uh, that this is a personal story, but I said I and we several times during discussion with kids, so I revealed myself accidentally. So what I... Um, uh, what what we what I found uh, in WHO uh, down to the local level, of course, in hospital they don't use this term at all. Uh, is that this this term? Does, I mean, there's no intelligence, and I'll try to explain why. But also them to propose what we need to do and how that uh, discipline can actually be used for these kind of problems. Uh, but uh, it was obvious for COVID-19, so in many ways it make it, it made it much much easier. Uh, to discuss all these problems uh, because of COVID-19 and, and, uh, and I will say it uh, because of, of the scandal, uh, scandalous situation globally when it comes to COVID-19. Um, so, so there is something called health intelligence. They, these people in, in public health called it public health intelligence. Uh, I was proposing to uh, based on my experience and identification of the exactly same gaps uh, in individual health and population health. We are calling it health intelligence now in WHO um, uh, and um, I would like to use this term to propose that within that discipline, uh, that uh, unstructured, uh, not ad hoc, but not easy to, uh, you, you cannot put it in a defined process, it's a detective work, but actually all that we're talking about, knowledge representation using rough theoretical structures uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge models, reasoning to discover using reasoners, so using, using descriptive formal logic to discover maybe some hidden properties that we did not define. Um, then discrete mathematics, graph theory and, and uh, using graph algorithms for network analysis, so analysis in specific domains, certain things and discovering more or using that for more uh, bigger or statistical models, uh, etc. So this, all these things, uh, this kind of um, advanced analytics, or, or I agree that we can call all that AI without knowledge representation reasoning, without logic, there is no decision making. And maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, AI is not used in health or machine learning. Uh, when you get statistical results, and we tried in Human Brain Project, the medical informatics platform, uh, you cannot make a decision that that you care about, which is this is about your patient. I mean, you have like performance of the model, and so what do you do about it? However, you measure, for example, accuracy, or you give a rock curve to to a given given expert, and then he doesn't know what to do about it. Like ninety nine percent or something, but what about one percent? How does that model work? Unfortunately, machine learning models that we called before machine learning, we call them. Um, uh, probabilistic optimization models or algorithms are black boxes. That's why computer scientists like me are so happy about using them. You don't need to be a statistician to just use a black box or to play around with it. Uh, but then when you give a result from the black box to somebody to make a decision, he can't. Uh, but then, you know, if you, if you do couple this with some knowledge base, with some rules, with some logic that knowledge representation reasoning has, then, then it seems plausible. It seems like a like a good uh, good idea uh, to talk about. So that's why health intelligence, then there is no health intelligence without contact, there's no intelligence, including in health, without uh, taking into account contextual information. And this is where everything falls apart in health. So, so without, without uh, Losing more time on, on, on this generic story. So here is, here is what the scope is of, of this part two. Uh, I hope I'll have a time in 15 minutes to um, just raise your interest by starting with what I mentioned, this new classification. Again, I, the case that I mentioned actually serves to basically, th this is the most practical part. Well, solution as well, as well is the third part. But this is to, to basically say, okay, this is the real life. You know, uh, we can talk in general ways about models and this and standards. Whoever wants to standardize science, good luck. And you want to harmonize term terminologies, good luck. <laughs> and, and so let's talk about real problems and see if we can, what we can do to 
come closer to grips or, or maybe do something better. So, so he, that, that's the purpose of the whole thing. So um, I will talk about complexity of terminology problem. Uh, I mentioned it already. I wanted to paint a picture of the case. Complex, you should forget everything I said, but have intuition that it was really complex and catastrophic and, and impossible to by anyone to, to simply do anything about. Um, but then, you know, knowledge develops slow, slowly, you know, um, but it develops. Not in our lifetime, so the question is, <laughs> Can we can we make something? Maybe maybe the process is not right. Maybe we can do something different. But here we go. Um, and uh, and then of course this is this is our conference all about, or at least partially, uh, ontology powered semantic. Or I like to use semantic graphs, the old name, rather than knowledge graphs. I don't know. Maybe because Google said it's knowledge graphs, that's how they named their semantic graph back in 12, 2012. But uh, yeah, this is when we're thinking about knowledge graphs. Um, in, in action, uh, of course, it was not on this level of development, and even now um, I have been struggling, I have been systematically failing. So you heard the history. Uh, the first idea was maybe 16 years ago, <laughs> it's too early. Um, still, WHO is reluctant to actually leadership, not WHO, uh, but individuals uh, for different reasons that are not technical or whatever. So. Um, we need to work with with people who are have vested interest in health, which are primarily uh, physicians or field epidemiologists in in public health, and patients or or citizens to to try to influence decision makers to to move on and invest. Uh, and of course, interdisciplinary approach is is paramount. So. And then at the end, I will just summarize and suggest what the role of health intelligence discipline is, which should be then the full story about what is what is needed um, and what we should do not how but what so so the practical part is missing from 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 this part too uh, uh, i will mention at the end uh, there will be a workshop i don't know if i can mention other conferences so we won't before i see <laughs> whether i can but there will be workshops and, and some challenges as well over the course of the year. And, and so if somebody is interested, all the welcome to participate. The data will be there. And so we'll play around with this case. And also there will be case in the public health, which is quite interesting, actually. Um, so so <coughs> let's summarize what we, what we said, but in more general terms now. So you heard about one case. Um, what people in International League Against Epilepsy um, start insisting, and then definitely since the classification was agreed on that level, uh, they, th these, these are their words, actually. This is the copy, including the picture. Uh, and the picture, I, I must admit, is quite, quite accurate. It, it looks ex exactly like this. Um, so. It was really important to have a classification of epilepsies and the under um, the, the, the name. So, so for once, they did not overstate what they did. This, the, the understate, if, if you, I'll show you how it looks like briefly. Um, it's not a classification, it's definitely par excellence ontology. Uh, so uh, so they, they created this new classification of epilepsies. And the purpose is for clinical diagnosis. And because they set the purpose straight, that's why they developed ontology. They, they didn't just stick with, OK, this is just uh, names and different classifications. But there is also connection between and what causes what. There is an overlap. There is a syndrome level. There is a, there is a, a, a symptom or, or disorder level. And there is a seizure level and so on. So um, it was really, really good. So, so this is the testament to, to uh, stop thinking about solutions first. Let's think about the problem and let's decide what we want to solve. And then, you know, we'll find the most optimal solution that we collectively can know. So, so um, this is lessons learned, I think, that we should take from them as well. It took them a long, I think too long, but at least. Um, and so, you know, Again, what they stated is they wanted to have a transparent language to use words that mean what they say. Um, it's uh, 
written by Ingrid E. Schaeffer, who is one of the authors of, of this paper in 2013, and I took it from her presentation. But it probably sounds really familiar. She didn't know about knowledge graphs. I don't think so. It was just one year after Knowledge Graph with Google published in 2012. And things, not strings, she never heard, but she said that. So you, you need to communicate, patients, doctor, you need to communicate between experts. For example, if that kid um, uh, was lucky to have this communication as that paper written by her doctor in 2011, maybe it could have stopped and you know she would not have developed all these different problems later on. So things not strings is what they said without knowing that, so, you know, ontologies and you know, this uh, uh, control vocabularies and knowledge models and, and, and all these best practices that we're using when we want to de design knowledge models. Um, so basically what, what the proposal here is that patient data should be annotated using um, this ontology, new classification. Is it annotated? No, because this data exists with, with patients or parents of patients that do this like these parents do for that girl. Um, this doesn't see medical records. What you can find in medical records is uh, an odd consultation report in English, French, German, Dutch, with some things mentioned. And then if there is a classification of disease, then there is a code, a disease name. If there is none, there is no code, just disease name. And so if you go, so yes, natural language processing uh, would help to clean the whole thing. But going forward to be more efficient, maybe we should engage people in saying, okay, like your colleagues did with classification, can you please add structured information and annotate your text at least, or annotate your data using what we have. So, and maybe we can help them by automating this somehow. And again, without having this multidisciplinary approach from the hospital level to global level, really creating self-sustainable or sustainable teams as they don't do today, uh, this could work, but you can, you can, mo most of the people who work at least in that part, these parts of the world I know, I think Germany as well, that part I know as well, uh, because of the hub for pandemic epidemic intelligence, uh, but uh, it's mostly people who are medical doctors in healthcare or medical doctors slash epidemiologists who finished some specialization medical informatics or, or only had six months, I don't know, course of bioinformatics, and then they are architects, they are, they are engineers, uh, and then they pay an odd outsource, an odd software development. Once of, there is no financing, sustainable financing for operation maintenance, and of course these technologies are not known. So it's, it was extremely painful and time consuming to try to communicate this uh, throughout the system. I think Satwik, you, you had a feeling. We, we had a project together with, with Fraunhofer Institute uh, lately. Um, and you never had four hours, including break, uh, to talk in this way. You have five minutes, three minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. You write books, but nobody reads. You, you can bring horse to the water, you can't make him drink. So you write hundreds of pages of documents with all these illustrations and more text, but you know, it's, it doesn't, it's really difficult. So what we did uh, in, in the scope of um, our team, uh, which was now placed in WHO Hub for Pandemic Epidemic Intelligence in Berlin, um, and I'm not with that team anymore. That's a long WHO story. Um, uh, but um, the idea was to, to basically um, start promoting this, uh, uh, this idea of networking and start creating these multidisciplinary teams. And then what, what really happens in reality is that um, organizations work different ways. I don't think HR is a problem. I think it's reluctance of, of those who are responsible and accountable for the system to make a change. And apparently change is big. So like any big system, it's very difficult to move. The inertia is quite big. So I guess that's, that's the lessons learned. So again, can we still do something uh, in different way? Yes. I have a question. Um, 
if tyrants were so and are so active uh, in red diseases above all, um, I, I'm asking myself if they play a role in doing this classification of new ontologies or to be transparent also for them because they, they are so active. They should. I can tell you my experience. Uh, um, they help. They're appreciated. They're respected. Um, experts or people from the system like to talk with them. They don't like to talk that much because they want to solve the problem. They have a problem at home. It's it's about the kid. It's not about intellectual discussion. Uh, but at the end, they have no influence. It's uh, health population and individual health is highly eminence-based world. And as an engineer, I can relate to that. If you put two engineers or three engineers in the room <laughs> or three doctors. So, so it's, it's, it's a, there is a, there is a human component, but, but seriously, organizationally, it's, it's an eminence-based, uh, it's, uh, you know, hierarchy is quite steep. There are good reasons for that, but then go, whenever you, you put hierarchy too steep and, and a big, big system, then that system is slow. And so parents don't have any, any place. Um, even in parents' organizations in Europe, it's doctors who are, who are, who are there and uh, some legal experts who are not patients. There are more patient organizations in, in, in US. There are some patient organizations in Europe as well. They're trying to, there's one in Switzerland, for example, Pro Raris, uh, which is the uh, biggest Swiss organization of patients with rare illnesses. Um, but the leadership uh, took the, um, prioritized trying to politic influence politics in Switzerland, trying to have a political influence so that rules can change and provide more support and more investment in, in rare diseases, for example, which does not solve our problem. That problem is not tackled, so uh, it's it's very difficult from a patient point of view. My experience for the last twenty years uh, to to influence system whatsoever, and that's the reason I joined fully professionally. I killed my career. Don't ask me about my salary. Everything <laughs> um, yeah. in two thousand sixteen when I joined health, it's uh, I thought okay from inside maybe, but it's it's really really difficult. Again, now as an engineer from inside. And with this credibility, knowing a little bit more about the system than average uh, engineer would do because of this experience from the patient point of view, it, it's not easy. It's really difficult. So I'm understanding correctly that this ontology was developed mainly by engineers and doctors? No, no. These are doctors only. It's, it's perfect. It's a perfect example. It just took them 15 years, but uh, but it's... it's, it's no, I said 11 is, is not for the, I mean, uh, new classification for epilepsy, new classification of seizures. That one example is, is a perfect example. Actually, I can move to the next slide too. So again, I, they, they don't know, uh, they don't use protege, they, they don't know RDF, they, they don't know what all is. I mean, they maybe think it's, it's an all, like an animal. But they did a perfect work. If you read, if you read the documents, I, I mean, I, I frankly didn't have time, but we need to put this in 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 all. So the 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 this one 2017 classification of seizure types, and there is much more to this when you start looking at definitions. It's perfect. Uh, so so that that's what I mean. ICD-11 doesn't have this at all, and SNOMED CT does not support. All well, that was 2017. And, and that, that will bring me to, when I talk about solution, I, I will try to remember to mention that as well. Um, how I see what SNOMED CT is, what ICD-11 is, um, how uh, one can think about uh, any of these vocabularies that might have some use in some processes in health uh, that come out of fire and so on and so forth. Um, so try to propose a layered architecture and to fit all them in a, in a proper space so that we can have health intelligence. And again, so that we don't wait 15, 20 years, 100 years on experts to come with something that is perfect because they made a decision before they start working on that, that they need to do this for diagnostics. And then they made it perfect. I think that's, that's basically the key. You don't, you know, like our, my colleagues from 
health layer 7, OSI layer 7, application layer, wanted to create one size fits all um, model, not knowing enough about decision making in health, right? Like none of us who are not yet domain. So the doctors are bound, the experts are bound to make the right ontologies. And that's something that we discussed uh, when, when we were working on this. Experts must be owners of the ontologies and ontology design, held by knowledge engineers or knowledge scientists or ontologists, so that you know this knowledge base can be encoded in machine-readable form in RDF in a proper way, so that you know, all the axioms will serve the purpose. If, if, you, if you take if you take this this ontology classification stereotypes, um, there's a lot of axioms in the text. That the perfectly defined all axioms there in the text. So, and that's because you know on the on the left hand side. Um, they describe things that exist. So what is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a condition. You can even say it's a symptom or something. Uh, you know, the brain is misfiring occasionally, frequently, for no apparent reason, you don't know the reason, or sometimes you do. So when you do one, then it's a syndrome. It's not a disease, but it's a syndrome, uh, by definition of the syndrome. By the way, Slovak CT does not have, as far as I know, definition of the syndrome. ICD definitely doesn't have. It has names of the diseases, but there is no node which is a disease. So, so when you, when you, we, I mean, we are missing some reference, even domain ontology reference, domain ontology concepts in, in, in these different classifications that, that we would need if you want to connect contextual information with something that exists that is a disease or something that exists, but it's not a disease, it's an illness, which is basically uh, how you feel or sickness, which is how society see you and so on. And you know, we are talking about semantics here that if, if used in analytics, if used by, by these algorithms I would mention, would then make sense. And there's this kind of, this kind of disciplined way, if you want, a more rigid way to describe things that exist in as proper way as we can um, is, is necessary to be, per to, to, to be useful for analytics. Otherwise it's just some annotation, yeah, can be published in a, in a given paper, but cannot be used for analytics. Uh, but I'll come back to that detail later. So, so again, complexity uh, of the problem is that there are seizures and seizures are easy to diagnose relatively. Well, this kid waited for some time un un unnecessarily, but, uh, but still it's relatively easy to diagnose. If you think no problems, you put EEG and then you diagnose, well, you'll be surprised that 50% is an accuracy of EEG. You have, you have false negatives and uh, false positives uh, in EEG as well. A lot. Um, the, 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 the diagnosis for epilepsy is uh, um, symptoms and, and reported and contextual information by patients to to an expert. That's how, how epilepsy is diagnosed since since long time ago. So uh, seizure types, and then when somebody thinks about the, the meaning and things that exist, it's true. Focal onset, generalized onset, obviously unknown onset, right? And so I won't go into details, but you know, you have then epilepsy when, when you have more than one seizure happening. And then you can have etiology or not. If you have etiology, you can talk about syndromes and then etiology can be structural, genetic, infectious. So, so this is why I said it's ontolog ontological. It becomes, you start having cause and effect. It's not just classification, like, like maybe this um, thing on the right hand side might uh, you know, mislead you to believe it's, it's, it's actually much more there in these definitions than which they thought it's important when you make a decision. So here you go. Um, maybe before the break and then we go. Uh, just this one because that's... So terms that are no longer in use and uh, I, I can share with you if somebody's interesting these, these case reports and everything else. I will, I will put it after in one place after, after this tutorial so whoever is interested can, can see this. If, there's something you know useful there. <laughs> These were the terms, terms before: complex partial seizure, simple partial, psychic, <laughs> discognitive, secondary, generalized, tonic, clonic, and things like that. Um, these are just the names, and they obviously don't describe. They're just terms 
more or less abstract, not really descriptive. So, so they, they break out of that one and went with, you know, describing things that exist and all of a sudden the whole terminology changed, which then enables much easier and quicker diagnosis because it's symptomatic. You can, you can actually have a name of the symptom. Symptom is there. You connect few symptoms and you know it looks like, it looks like neurological or epileptological problem. So that's in very simple terms, very simple logic there. Um, I, I said Snowman CT and ICD-10-11 have no support for new epilepsy uh, ontology. And it took uh, International League against epilepsy, to my knowledge, based on the first published thing I found in 1998, 15 years to, to come. Actually, it came in 2013. It was published in 2017. So it's, the time is of essence here. So I, I propose we take a break if you have any questions, more questions on this, you know, general trans complexity. Yes, please. Um, about the ontology um, development itself, that uh, doctors were or domain experts were the one uh, doing it. Um, so I was a bit more <laughs> interested in technical things that are they the ones also putting everything together, elements of the ontology, or they are just describing and some ontology engineers are using it. Uh, to basically develop the ontology, or no, you're providing a platform for the doctors to do it. So we, we don't have this. Uh, maybe I was I was not clear enough. So this these doctors, uh, these experts who worked in uh, through international league against epilepsy to define what I call ontology. They call classification of seizures, but it's more than that. Um, um, they they're not aware that they designed an ontology. They just put the body of knowledge in their way. So it's a text, it's documents, some of these diagrams. Uh, uh, there was nobody, there was no knowledge engineers or ontologists or knowledge scientists who worked with them to make it. Actually, we don't yet have this coded. So this is an interesting thing to, an interesting exercise. Even academic can, can help a lot, in my opinion. Although the data is not there in the health records, but it's not a problem. Um, but actually, and I'll mention this later when I propose a solution. Uh, yes, in my opinion, that's why one example of interdisciplinary project is needed. Yeah, I mean, uh, ontologists, people who know semantic web, semantic web technologies, uh, who know about existence of, of graph theoretical models, you know, uh, who can help experts um, uh, should, should work alongside them. I can tell you my experience. Um, uh, one colleague of mine who is uh, seasoned field epidemi uh, epidemi epidemiologist, so he really worked mostly in Africa, long, long years. He was responsible in in this epileptic, uh, epidemic intelligence from open sources initiative where I worked for um, uh, something we called categories, or basically the names of the topics that our NLP engine is discovering in the text. And these are lexical rules he was taken care of. And then we started working together and I slowly introduced him to concept of, you know, defining things that exist, which is very close to his mind. Um, he is not an expert, but he's using he protégés his tool. I, 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 didn't, I, was, I was thinking, no, we need to build a tool for these guys. They find it very easy because, because actually, really, it's their knowledge. It's, it's, it's what it is. So, so really, it's not that I don't think it's difficult to work together. You just need to reach out. You need to be focused on the problem you want to solve, not on the techniques, uh, not on the representation of things, but things that exist. And that's where an expert play the role. And, and so... Because I think uh, in the sense, I, I'm not the one, but I've heard a lot from the community, specifically semantic web community, that they will call it, uh, why you're calling it even ontology and not for control vocabulary, because that's why I'm asking that you know, this complexity can arise that they don't even accept it as an ontology if there is not an engineer or a specific platform that guide them through it. Um, but uh, that's that's interesting too. Yeah, I, 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 I would disagree with these comments because I mean, we took, uh, I mean, we, we took the term from, from the philosophy and now we, we think it belongs to us and uh, it's yeah. like a technical, you know, RDF file turtle format describing you know, uh, RDFS or, or SCOS or all concepts there, you know, different properties. <laughs> it's yeah. not really what ontology is. Ontology is what this, in my opinion, mm -hmm. 
and, and, and because then then we are we are exactly doing what we said it's not the best practice best practice is to describe things that exist not representation of these things and now we're talking about ontology's representation as something that must be no uh, actually even i'm referring to bioinformatics as more informaticians as well that they have precise uh, term uh, like definition for uh, even control vocabularies, thesaurus, ontology. So these levels yep. should be met, otherwise they cannot ontology. And that's why I was wondering how we are making sure that what is created is really ontology. Why, why we are calling it ontology if it is only uh, created by domain experts? You know what I mean? I mean, for example, SNOMED, uh, ICD-10, um, for example. ICD-10, it's not an ontology, right? It's control vocabularies. So I wonder what what is the level that exists here that we call them ontology. So, yeah, okay, I understand the question now. Uh, so, uh, in, in my, I mean, as as, as you know, uh, first you have control vocabularies, or even dictionaries first, then control vocabularies which can be used for classification, so taxonomies. Then thesaurus, which you can have some synonyms and 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 whatnot, and then you have ontologies which actually have this more complex you know relationships between things cause and effect or, or some some complex um, um, property definitions like you know uh, and 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 so um, it depends on the purpose you'll have all this all the time I mean it's theoretical discussion here the reason I was calling this classification epilepsy ontology because it's really ontology it's not as ours it's not a classification it's not a taxonomy Yet they call it classification, so implying it's taxonomy only. But what they described is a, a connection with syndromes, connection with etiology that has its own panomic representation. I'll come to that after the break. Yeah, you have physiological data, phenotypic data, you have genomic data, proteomic metabolic data, metabolic information, sorry, not data, information in, uh, in, in that thing that they call classification of epilepsy, which is actually ontologic. I mean, the whole design, the whole model, knowledge model is ontology itself, by definition. Thank you. For that. And I don't want an answer now, because maybe it was more in the discussion, <laughs> we had the coffee break, right? <laughs> but the question is, okay, you have these artifacts to express a bit the knowledge around the epilepsy, right? That we can call it ontology or not, that's another discussion, right? Yeah. Where do you put it? I mean, if you really want, in the, in the overall workflow, right? Okay, you say it's nomad, but nomad has a clear place. You get an initial system, you get the field, right? And uh, same ICD, right? Similar. If you have this artifact expressing the knowledge across different uh, threads, where do you put it? Where do you use it? Maybe that's for the discussion. Because uh, I have it, I have it okay. on, on the part three, okay. hopefully. Part three, okay, good. Hopefully. It's good for the break. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, part three. <laughs> Now coming to to the point, and, and sorry sorry for this picture. It was actually looked different on my Mac, but when I put it on here on the Windows, somehow colors disappeared here. But um, it, it 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 will become bigger in a second in the next slide. So um, so yeah, in connection to this short discussion about control or vocabulary, thesauri and and ontologies. Um, we need more ontologies. We're stuck with some taxonomies of this kind or different kinds of control vocabularies. Maybe some thesauri help, but for the given research purpose. I mean, that's also histor historical. All these so-called ontologies, I mean, all these are publications from the research. Very little application, etc. And then SNOMED CT and ICD are developing historically. Uh, in the way they do and pretty much central way. So the question is, is that possible? Um, I'll come to the solution in the next part, but we need ontologies. So one way to look at an ontologist could be this one. So if you take system biology, for example, language, and, you know, take the view on one person from different omics, so phenotype, physiological data, anatomic data, genome, transcriptome, epigenome, proteome, metabolome, microbiome would be like the bacteria inhabiting the body, uh, exposome would be connection with environment, right? Um, 
then maybe one way, then we need to fit size and symptoms somewhere. Um, healthcare services, for the lack of the better name, um, is information coming from healthcare. So inpatient, outpatient visits, case reports, all these things, cohort data sets and whatnot, and sociodemographic data. So <clears throat> now you have in one person changing over time, all these different connections and relationships or patterns between different data elements in a pretty complex way. Um, so this is one way to look at, you know, how one ontology can be defined. And this, this, this was there as an idea for a long time. Uh, don't know, uh, one publication was there, I'll mention it later. In 2011, US Academy of, National Academy of Sciences, one team gathered for a week published a book, like a report was two or 300 pages. And they basically more or less talked about the same thing, that this is the way how we can break these silos and start connecting other otherwise disconnected information uh, about one patient and then groups of patients and start, you know, getting this ready for diagnostics. And then again, to go back to this new classification of epilepsies, as their authors is calling it, that's what they did inevitably when they start thinking about practical use of it. They wanted it for practical use and all of a sudden you have much more complex definition of, I mean, knowledge model is much more complex. So, um, this way or the other we need that all this information that is for one patient who knows where, when, since a mother was pregnant with a baby, information is somewhere, birth, then general practitioners or, or you know, primary healthcare um, data, then you move from country to country, from city to city, it's scattered all over the place and it's not connected and potentially it can be, it can be useful for, for, for many reasons. We don't have this, we still have tables, observations, columns, which don't have any relationships defined between themselves. We do some statistics, we do some averages. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that later, but since I mention it now, when you look at averages, then you have that kid being undiagnosed and puzzled because by average it's fine. It's perfectly healthy, but it's not because you are not having information of that kind in tables. So. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is one way to look at things, um, and, and definitely we need to, to have this annotation. Again, many of these things uh, are described in different ways, so there's no unique name assumption as, as we don't have it in semantic web. Um, anyone can see anything about any topic as we have it as a web slogan anyway. Um, uh, Okay. And, and it's okay, I'm not implying yet solution. I'm just saying how to, what do we need to describe uh, anything we need to describe about one individual? Well, we need this, or one form or another. And again, if we have some, or some taxonomies about this and some taxonomies about that, we need to connect the two somehow. And this, this relationship, if you think about formalisms, needs to be defined somewhere here or here or in the third place. And so, again, this is a solution. I'm reaching out to solution now, I'll stop for now. But conceptually, this is what we need. This is the point. And um, Okay, so just to zoom in. So um, every person has some phenotypic traits, height, weight, eye color, Skin color, you probably can't see it from me, right? Maybe have a big head, you can't see it half of the screen. Um, then some physiological information, like, you know, high blood, blood pressure, um, you know, uh, body temperature, oxygen concentration, anatomy of different kind, not only skeletal, brain anatomy, for example. Um, then you have um, genetic relation related things, genome, transcriptome, epigenome. Then all that is encoding how cells produce proteins, so protein biology, then 
how they come together in metabolic cycles. We have metabolome. Um, and I mean, you get a drill. This, this is what we need, really. And, and we need to describe this, describe things that exist. So we take Loink. Loink is uh, and probably useful, <laughs> not that much used as, as probably people would like to, for encoding lab tests or workups. But workup is not body temperature. It's it's workup to measure body temperature. So there is there is a missing link there for again describing a thing that exists that then you can use in in your different kind of analytic methods as data that knowledge as data to basically derive some some insight. So so this is basically the point of of this. Um, so not forgetting that that these these control vocabulary these knowledge models control vocabulary statistics ontologies um, uh, should describe things that exist. So yes, lab test exists, but lab lab test is not proteome. It represents it describes proteome under certain conditions in a certain period of time under certain context for the certain patient. Um, so all this <laughs> additional information is missing so far, and somehow an expert needs to find a way to connect in his head. So far, we're not working systematically on making this happen. And I think, you know, what's missing, if, if you start from maybe from my experience working with some bioinformaticians, uh, when it comes to solution, you need also guys who know a little bit more deeper, for example, on mathematics side and on software engineering side to make it work in, in production. So these interdisciplinary teams coming together, combining this knowledge, learning from each other, potentially could bring a solution forward and much faster forward than we have right now. So I, I, I'm guessing for the audience, I don't need to, to talk about this, but just in case, uh, I don't know who I, I suggested that doctors can also um, connect or participate in different disciplines to make a point interdisciplinary. So, so by knowledge representation, um, what we mean is is uh, graph theoretical structures or using graph theoretical structures to now one thing is we can call it data graphs to to basically transform this information from tables into into graphs right uh, to connect features and properties uh, of these observations of individuals um, in this in this way um, then you know knowledge models i stick with ontologies because i'm trying to use examples here but not only ontologies, uh, to annotate interconnected data and then provide additional information. So this is, this is something that, that, that this brings us. So data is there, but data about patients is, unless it's coming from a sensor like this, glucose patches for interstitial glucose measurement every five minutes, um, it's, it's uh, like snapshots in time. What happens between two snapshots is not registered anyway. So data is incomplete. It's bound to be incomplete and decision must be made based on incomplete information. So one way to tackle this problem of making decisions based on incomplete information is to take into account knowledge as information. So you annotate data you have, but you also have this knowledge connected with annotated data. And so you can discover some patterns or you can discover that something you might need is missing because you have knowledge about existence of that in general. So this is, this is what um, um, graph theoretical structures are used. Um, this is obvious example of knowledge representation. Um, and then knowledge representation is also implementation of these knowledge models uh, in, in, in software, in, in, in forms of semantic or knowledge graphs, right? So there you can use different software tools, maybe some graph database system management systems or build your own whatever software tool, that's, that's the point, where you can store or, or you know, use data in certain formats that is um, useful or ready for you know, software algorithms to process it. And uh, last but not least, uh, and I'll come back to that solution, bear with me please, um, then use semantic web technologies. By that, I mean RDF, uh, link, linked data um, framework or concepts to interconnect data, information, insights, and knowledge. Uh, I'm using this data, information, insights, and knowledge for years now. 
that's the simplest way for me to say it's not just data. It's not just data and information like a video or picture or whatever document. It's an insight. It's a pattern I discovered. I want to share it with you. And it's knowledge like this, knowledge-based and coded knowledge. So like we can call it information. All that is information anyway. Um, so unless I miss something, but more or less this is what knowledge representation means. Now, what's reasoning? Um, I think it's useful. All these reasoners are quite useful if, if you know, the best practices are followed. Uh, you have two options. One is to manually make sure that you define every single complex property and every single axiom, for example, if you use all. Or you can use the reasoners to derive, to infer axioms for existing axioms. And sometimes this inference actually is, is more than enough to give you an insight. You simply haven't thought about certain things that can be inferred. So you don't really need graph analytics at all. Um, so I think it's a useful tool. And again, so in, in a nutshell, reasoning is use of now semantic web technologies. At least that's what we have today is automated reasoning uh, to create semantically rich set of applications. I mean, semantically rich, not definitions in a human readable format, but more like uh, axioms and, 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 uh, and, 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 um, and more complex properties. Uh, so use of all axioms to define complex control vocabularies, such as the new international sepsis classification of seizures. And then use the reasoners to test existing and derive unspecified properties in compl complex control vocabularies. Um, and maybe I should say written complex knowledge models to be more generic, not control of Kevin is all. Uh, I like this picture. I think I found it somewhere uh, in, in, in some, <laughs> yeah. So I, I won't put uh, ads to this company. Not, 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 not because they have something against them, although they have not delivered last time we worked together, but uh, um, I like this this diagram because it's it's depicting actually exactly where we are missing things when it comes to analytics and data processing. Uh, so um, in vast majority of statistical uh, probabilistic models, we have assumption that we have a normal distribution. So we first make assumption that that my model like features are independent variables. And we know it's problematic. We never, we're not sure about covariates and, uh, uh, but this is an assumption. And then we have assumption that the normal distribution is, is the rule um, in H. And it's proven that it works in many cases. Um, but then if you think about things that exist, uh, we know that there is a lot of correlation, at least uh, we know and we experience correlation between things. They're connected. And now here we talk about proto-metabolome and whatnot. So you know, things are influencing each other. So we know that actually graph representation actually, um, it's graph theoretical structures that can represent, that can be used one way to be used to represent things. And then there, we know per, that Pareto principle works. 80-20 rule, or power law, as they call it in economics. Um, and when you think about graphs, that's when I talk with some kids, I tell them about social networks. Um, you are connected with <coughs> relatively small number of people com comparing to, for example, all the users of Facebook. So there's a vast majority, a large number of people have just a few connections with others. So vast, vast number of nodes has a huge, uh, small number of, of relationships. And one very small number of nodes has a lot of relationships and connections with others. So it's really this exponential curve here. So there is a disconnect really. If you, if you represent things as a graph, then this graph here uh, that, that was statistically conformed to normal distribution, these relationships would be like every node will be connected to almost every node. They're just like 
randomly connected. Whereas we know in, 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 in nature it's not like that. And in society. And in economy. And in politics. So anyway, in life. So this is more to, to start thinking and bring intuition. Why do we need more mathematics if we want to get closer to have models that are better representing realities? I mean, the definition of model is representation of a part of reality, right? So, so, um, so discrete mathematics, and graph theory, and graphs is seemingly one of the missing links, as we all know, when it comes to life science, population health, and individual health or healthcare. Um, and it actually, if you think about again this case, it makes all the difference. So when you start connecting, you discover. Um, one part of some metabolic cycle in cells, um, which you do not discover using every average, any averages. When you look at, do all these workups on this case, which I didn't mention, you find that according to average, everything is fine. Maybe there's some underlying metabolic problem that was not found because, I mean, we have these averages. We have maximum value and minimum value for your blood workups, right, for different things. But things doesn't work that way, and they can vary pretty significantly between individuals as well, and we know that as well. So my homeostasis is not your homeostasis. We might be comparable, seemingly we are, or we think we are because we're okay and we're healthy anyway, and self-curing exists as well. So, so maybe we don't care that much, but in these extreme cases, um, you see the difference. For example, extreme case on health, like this sportsman who are extremely fit, you see the big difference, and these very ill people. And there you cannot help either if you do averaging. Averaging does, doesn't work. So, so seemingly we need to also think about um, power law and we need to think about different statistics if you want, and then using graph theory, including statistical models in the graph theory to, to describe reality. So. So here is more intuition. Um, and again, this part two, unfortunately, I, there is no time in the tutorial. Uh, maybe next uh, time in the workshop, um, um, sharing data and trying to illustrate how this really works. Um, and so mention some workshops and follow-ups that, that will happen. And if you, if you have time, uh, be our guests. I will share the, this patient data, a full data set and have some challenges of, discovering what we discovered. Can we use these models? Which models? You know, how can we connect? And, and maybe you know, to, to, to these participant illust participants illustrate um, the promise, I would say not power, but the promise of using discrete mathematics alongside of uh, mm -hmm. statistics and probability. Um, so finally, uh, definitions. Uh, What's the network analysis? We have knowledge representation, reasoning, and network analysis. So the, the term is tightly connected with graph algorithms or graph theory. So graph algorithms or graph theory is domain agnostic. It just doesn't matter what the, the vertex and, and edge represent. Uh, you have the same mathematics. Network analysis is more used uh, when you have health, when you have this you know, semantically rich uh, uh, model when, when you know what node means and what relationship means. And then it's more analysis of that network, social network, you know, um, network of, of, of cells in one organ, network of organs in one body, whatever. Um, so network analysis are graph, uh, based on graph algorithms um, and graph algorithms are based on graph theory and statistics. And they're used to analyze graph structures. And um, you have different, you can group algorithms in different kind of, some provide just purely statistical information. Like, you know, you can, you can see the structure, you know, how many nodes are connected um, um, with how many other nodes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can have graph or network analytics. There you discover patterns using uh, basic querying, like you would use Sparkle query or a little bit more complex algorithms like pathfinding, for example. And then you have, on a more complex uh, and more potential useful way, graph-powered AI 
or this is maybe oxymoron because maybe there is no AI without graph. <clears throat> because you cannot save this result or this insight anywhere apart from your notebook or some file again, which is not useful. But if you can connect your insight or your result of the algorithm back in the graph, then you can talk about well expanding this, connecting these neurons in your brain as they do. Um, and 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 I, I will not dwell on this again. You know, I was thinking to to go through examples based on this kid, but this will take much more time if if we want to do it properly. So it's not in the scope of this tutorial, unfortunately. Um, but graph powered AI can support uh, uh, probabilistic models in many different ways to discover covariates and you know to basically minimize bias. Uh, if you need to build a model based, for example, some regression model. Uh, to really make sure to, or, to, or to discover um, uh, independent variables and those that are not. Um, it can be even more useful in uh, explaining how neural networks work. Um, some projects, explainable AI, as they call it, going back the, the chain, uh, trying to understand, for example, how the algorithm really understands the image and so on. Um, Again, that's for some other other discussion. There's a lot there. And <clears throat> I said then to finish with this, so this is still um, first to uh, still domain agnostic. Network analysis is domain specific. So really um, applied to semantically rich data, is, um, information insights and knowledge that we usually call it network analysis rather than just graph theory or graph algorithms. But this is what we use. So. And the last on this, um, for now, just theory, just just to have a feeling of, of what we're talking about as a part of the solution. I think this is this is finite. I can't remember I, any any uh, algorithm that doesn't belong to these five different groups. So you have pathfinding, and again, if if you see, I mean, you can use it. You can use different methods for the discovering similar things. It's really about pattern recognition or, or discovering of some new, unexpected, unusual relationship or, or node, something you don't expect, um, uh, or something that is common, um, um, uh, common patterns or, or, or some common features uh, between, for example, different patients, for example, if, you, if they have same size and symptoms, um, and you don't know, I have nothing in literature about this autoimmune disorder, uh, but imagine that uh, this connected information about patients globally is accessible to experts. That poor expert that uh, call this patient puzzle, puzzle case can maybe query saying, is there somebody similar or send me, show me similar uh, patients uh, with this one based on this criteria and we put signs, symptoms and whatnot, and you can discover, for example, centrality of anti gdo to antibodies because it's discovered in 10 out of 30 patients and you didn't have any idea about this. I'll give you an example on, again, manual way of, of dealing. So in discussion, consultations uh, online with the name of the professor is Sudhir Gupta from University of California, Irvine. He, he was famous uh, in the autistic spectrum children. Again, he's a neurologist, um, not really related to this girl's problem. She doesn't have autism. Uh, but we, we connected with everyone, so here we go. Uh, and um, in the discussion, he said, poor girl, she's probably the only one in the world. And then I asked him, how do you know? And then it was a long wait, at least I remember a long wait on the phone or on the Skype. And then he said, well, actually I don't. I never tested my kids soon that, so maybe I should. So that's the, that's the thing. You know, how about working together over days, weeks, months, years, having this established as, as a normal procedure to connect more, to expand, and, and then things will happen, you know, uh, uh, one by one. So, so these algorithms or network analysis can serve that really finding patterns in, in connected data based on different other criteria so you can get insights then then use as a new data or new knowledge. 
you can also test uh, existing knowledge. You can discover that we disagree. We have different descriptions of the same thing. And so this is the great domain for the research rather than what a given editor or given, given magazine would like to have this year and things like that. So, um, so we have these three concepts that are not used to my knowledge at all in practice. And now stand corrected if there's some private sector companies engaging with somebody to make it in practice. Lately, I, I started being engaging, uh, but I, I don't really know. Um, all this is known in research domain. The problem is we have a grant for six months to two years old, two years long grant. Uh, we scope it so we can do it, we publish, and then we chase another grant that might be off topic completely. So when you look at all this proliferation, for example, on what the people call ontologies, in biology you have it, how, how many, you, you tell me, I don't know, how many hundreds, uh, the same topics, but they're not complete and they're not made to serve the purpose of, you know, being used by this analytics to, to basically discover things in practice. And, mm -hmm. So, so here is basically discussion or, or um, um, importance of start using these concepts, but in production for, for the purpose, for analysis, and then test its, its own uh, integrity and quality and improve over time. So it's not a big bang approach that I'm suggesting. It looks like a big bang. And I heard many times, oh, you want to boil the ocean. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we need to start doing this, um, maybe because we didn't start or we haven't start, started yet. We, it seems like, oh, it's big. Well, every new, new thing is scary and big, but let's start first baby step at a time. I think we have accumulated knowledge and there's curriculum all over the place. So we, we have place where to start. Um, and now I'm coming to, to what I think is, is one of the ways, arguably maybe the best way we have so far, best terminology uh, to describe what we need to do. Um, I mean, there is something called health intelligence discipline, or there is something described uh, in different ways, um, interchangeably with surveillance um, on paper. Um, because we don't have these prerequisites, one can argue, I would argue, that health intelligence discipline does not really exist. Uh, when I want to use, when I want to provoke, I say everybody's faking <laughs> existence of health intelligence. Surveillance, when you talk about public health, for example, exists. It's about collection of the information. Uh, in a given scope, in a given place, in a given time. So it's well-defined scope before you start collecting, otherwise it doesn't make any sense, right? And then you systematically collect, <coughs> analyze, analyze in terms of mostly exploratory analysis. It's relatively simple. And then disseminate some findings to try to explain reality in a given time. So, um, you can say that surveillance exists in healthcare. So your doctor is trying to figure out, based on signs and symptoms, where to go, decides where to go, goes there, collects, and see if that is known. If it's not, maybe he'll try two times, three times, four times, and then, based on experience that I described, then stop. There's nothing else we can do. Whereas <coughs> health intelligence objective is a little bit different. So the intelligence objective is <clears throat> actually to discover patterns or to use discovered patterns to <clears throat> to basically reach out and maybe one day in future, who knows when, have forecasting capabilities. So if we learn about patterns, then you discover that some patterns is evolving in a population or an individual, and then you can maybe understand better, you know, where it goes and have some preventive measures and, and you know, help that way. So... <clears throat> You know, diagnosis doesn't serve that. Diagnosis serves to, to get this scope and try to figure out what the treatment would be. <clears throat> At least that's, that's what the practice is doing for long years now, including today. 
So you put this diagnosis and then, and then also patients expect that, unfortunately, many people expect there is that one magic pill. So <laughs> have a diagnosis, here's a magic pill, you fixed like car mechanic, which is, so health intelligence discipline introduced this, this concept so of pattern detection. If you want anomaly detection belongs there, detection of new unexpected, unusual, and use of these insights um, and correlate this with contextual information. So it's not, if, if you don't take into account broader understanding of the environment, in, in, when it's one individual behavior um, and, and uh, you know, other, other potentially important elements uh, to describe the status or, or the condition of a given individual, then you miss it. Then you're averaging that person. If when you average, then at least these extremes, these twenty percent, are out. And in these twenty percent, you actually have these unknown things. That's where the science is, not in known things. So, so for the health intelligence discipline, um, or what health intelligence discipline does, is also integration of data, information, insights, and knowledge from different sources, including unexpected sources. as a contextual information. And then the objective of health intelligence, now, now we have a problem with terminology. Intelligence is both the name of the process and name of the result of the process. So actionable intelligence is that information. It's, it's the result of intelligence process uh, for decision making. So maybe one example is um, uh, researchers for long years now in, in health as well, uh, like to use Twitter. So imagine you can just tap in somehow and see what people are talking about the same topic and connect this. Maybe, you know, get quicker than waiting for publication to happen a certain time. Or publication never happens because, yeah, it's not publishable, that topic, but it's on the Twitter. Um, so it, it's, it's more obvious in public health. We do that. We actually stole um, this, this practice. It's called open source intelligence. Uh, so this is, you know, collecting information from publicly available sources. Uh, contextual information, trying to better understand what's going on, even even for early detection of new threats um, before they happen. So, so this is also what intelligence does. This is this is not what we have in the practice today. Definitely not in healthcare. And with your respect to my colleagues, but not a trace of that can be found in public health. When they ever, whenever you heard they say intelligence, actually they're talking about surveillance, and the terms are interchangeably used, which is a pity. We go back to semantics and taxonomy importance of having vocabularies that that properly define things. So that's why I, I, I I'm proposing to use this this term simply between us if we agree on the on the definition, to highlight that this is that domain where you're using contextual information but in an organized way. So you will have ontologies for travel and trade, you have ontologies, or controlled vocabularies to to put in simpler way for mass gatherings. You have for example, ontologies for chemical, radiological, bi uh, biochemical, and nuclear threats. You will need uh, control vocabularies to describe different vulnerabilities, uh, behavior. Um, all, all that is contextual information or, or directly or information of interest depending on the situation. Uh, it's not just biomedical. If you stick with biomedical, you're missing all these other parts. So in public health, they call it all hazards. One health approach will also, for infectious diseases, animal environment, come together. But um, in principle, intelligence is all that. Therefore, it's something that will never be made and finished. But it's a way of thinking. It's, it's actually uh, ev never-ending attempts to, to have a more timely and relevant uh, discovery or, or conceptualization of situation for better decision making the best we have. So again, you know, having interdisciplinary teams working on that. The reason I'm proposing um, is health is not in the industry. Uh, there is no intelligent or unintelligent health. There's a conference in Basel called Intelligent Health. <laughs> uh, I used to call it Unintelligent Health Conference. And then, you know, uh, the biggest of them all, they don't use it anymore, monetization of health. There's some guys some years ago who thought that Patient will share data if you pay them. Patient will pay you to take your data and do something about it. So like all these different things are, you know, 
simplification uh, instead of maybe you know thinking about you know using knowledge of different disciplines coming together to work on this domain that is sacred it's not an industry it's one of couple of most important domains of life with no health you have no industry right if we're all sick there is nothing so uh, it sounds like a uh, uh, change of paradigm and paradigm of people thinking, especially in today's world. But I think, um, and we have examples of that. It's not just me thinking uh, commercialization of health uh, and, and people simplifying thinking of it is causing more problems than, and especially lately. So the system is organized now. It's important to keep it. But focus was completely on that. And then the essence is forgotten. So... Like this, this glass glass ceiling is is still there. Um, the example in ep epilepsy, maybe it's, it's it's the best example. I don't know. Um, EEG software um, <clears throat> since two thousand four is exactly the same. There's nothing nothing new. Processing of that data, nothing new since two thousand four. So twenty years now. Um, it's it's more difficult to have new medications. So I can can't really use that as, as an example, but there are no, no new meds as well. But but for software, I don't see any <laughs> any excuse when it comes to well, knowledge and the rest. So there, there must be a reason. There is no economy there, and the focus is somewhere else. Again, patients and doctors don't have money to pay software companies. It's CEOs and CFOs of hospitals, and their, their, their job and... Uh, responsibility is to make sure that the whole system works and it's financed properly. So when you sell, sell electronic health records, uh, Cerner or Epic Systems, the two that emerged after George Bush's 30 billion, $30 billion, they're really optimized for charging and billing. Um, uh, they're not optimized for decision support and decision making. And that was not the idea. The idea, original idea was that electronic health records should support the doctors to be more efficient in liaising with patients. So decision support system or decision support components were supposed to be part of it. Now in, in, in this digital health industry, we're talking about separately decision support systems, which is an old name when I was starting my career. We used that name <laughs> for in different industries. So um, so I don't know if I... If I give a proper due to health intelligence discipline. This is a topic in itself, and there is a lot of examples there as well, and, and the data sets that can illustrate the difference. And um, I focused most of the last five years on the public health, so it doesn't fit here. Um, but, you know, discovery of these patterns and, you know, uh, the, the enabler of discovery of patterns such as that as a quite ontology that international league against epilepsy called classification of epilepsy is is uh, is a good example on, 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 on the public health I, I will not dwell I'll just tell you um, um, on a global level uh, in WHO uh, all the information from all the countries came in and we noticed very quickly in mid February beginning of March that there is a huge difference between uh, uh, morbidity and mortality rates, uh, COVID-19, between Italy and South Korea. The difference was so big that, you know, it was 2020, just the beginning, mid-February, mid-March. That actually it was not clear, is it the same virus, what's going on? Um, it's just a matter of how the data is collected, just to tell you that that simply. And, and um, I'll mention some, some other workshops that will happen soon. If you're interested, you can, you can come in and, and, and see more about actually more interesting than this cases from the public health so you don't know what's going on you get this if you don't understand the context if you don't don't know how this information is collected how uh, whom from uh, you you're confused and you usually don't like i talked with a colleague from south korean cdc and when she saw the diagram she said yeah we know about that but we never knew why they had this so the most prevalent uh, cases were kids between 20 and 29 year old kids in South Korean cell. No mortality, but the, the, the largest number of cases. And the reason, actually, I, I, I happened accidentally to no reason because of my telecommunication days. Uh, they had MERS and um, they had true mobility data from mobile network operators open to um, 
to public, basically to software companies. So you can create this, you can take data from mobile operators, create the software. Uh, what they did is they start sending alerts, SMS alerts to kids in, in the nightclubs or in, um, when they notice that there is somebody in nightclub who was tested positively to, to COVID. Then they will send, send SMS to everybody in the club that there are two cases COVID tested in the club. Go and test yourself. So kids were mass testing themselves with no symptoms, nothing. But you know, you, you don't know this. So this is a stupid example for how you need contextual information. You need to know that before. And, and somehow this information is lost in the system because everybody is doing surveillance and assuming things and uh, there is no place to share this information. Life is complex, right? So, um, so that's where health intelligence kicks in, basically. You, you can do only as much by um, collecting information, doing some exploratory analysis, some statistical analysis, and disseminating that. And then you need to do health intelligence, to, need to put the context, to put the more from his history, knowledge, try to understand better, to try to provide actionable intelligence for decision makers. And if it sounds like this spy agencies, that's exactly what they do. And they have intelligence, they, they have these multidisciplinary teams. So my point to these guys who are very extremely slow, actually, or, or immovable, <laughs> like with international organization levels and, and governments, is if you want to use it, go talk with your colleagues there and <laughs> just copy what they're doing. They're not doing this. They're just saying we have health intelligence, but they don't. So, so uh, but again, um, going back to healthcare. So what would be the sources of information for health intelligence discipline? It will be obvious, traditional healthcare sources, if, if you agree that the name is correct, I don't know. Um, I invented it. Um, but EHRs, PACs for radiology, some data sets, cohort data sets, because they are quite traditional. Um, then patient self-observations, like there is Abbott has, at least Abbott, for Abbott I know, they have these uh, glucose patches, like the measuring CC glucose for two weeks, uh, every five minutes. And they have near field communication, now they put the Bluetooth uh, to make it less, less uh, healthy. Um, and then it goes into Abbott Cloud, and you have application that can see yourself. You can actually download CSV file if you want to process further this information but it's not integrated with electronic health records. And so, um, yeah, can we do that as well? Uh, but anyway, for health intelligence, that's obviously what you need to do. Patient self-observations manual, or at least anecdotes, are always used in epilepsy for fine-tuning of the treatment, uh, et cetera. Then literature, I mean, that's, that's I guess, the thing that everybody's talking about. And many, many people in research are doing it, like natural language processing, trying to tease out um, topics from uh, mentions of certain topics from the text in the literature or in more advanced cases, events. So some things that happen in some place, in some period of time, somewhere. Um, then textbooks encoded using RDF knowledge models. Now that's a challenge, but that's experience with 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 a kid. Uh, textbook helped actually to connect the dots and understand maybe where we should look at what can be theoretically how the condition can be theoretically explained. Um, patient networks. Um, there is a common understanding between healthcare practitioners that, uh, at least to my experience. The patient networks and especially uh, patient group websites should be like Facebook groups should be ignored. Um, I think they don't have time to take it into account. So the first reaction is that, so, and in most cases they would be right. I mean, it's really biased. That's that's from experience for the last twenty years. But that's where you can find the hidden gem as well, and that's exactly what intelligence is all about. So if, if you, when you don't know, you don't know. When you want to go, I mean, GDPR is okay. It's just uh, wrongly understood in healthcare in Europe. But HIPAA has one sentence. The doctor is, uh, your attending physician is allowed to share only minimum necessary information. That's one of the sentences I can find. How do you know what's minimum necessary if you don't know anything about this? And this is, this is overly restrictive. 
So there is no chance we can have health intelligence also if you want to follow these regulations. So there's a lot to work that needs to be done there. Uh, I know it sounds again like, I hope it doesn't sound like boiling ocean because that's not the point, that's not the idea. But that, it does sound like <laughs> we need seriously to sit down and think what we want to do. And if you go back to these guys from International League Against Epilepsy, when it, it, for them it was as simple as saying, okay, we need to have terminology that can help us better diagnose. And all of a sudden it helped them to put great thing together just because they had a goal in mind. So maybe that's the way how we should approach these things. Um, my experience also is that uh, established organizations such as WHO, uh, then you know, some, some experience with uh, supranational organizations and European Commission, DG Santé, HERA, and, and it's, it's new one that sounds, looks like the others, governments, ministries of health, um, they're, they're extremely slow. And there are a lot of other vested interests there that they are simply not prioritizing focusing on these points. Telling physician, patient, and the science that comes out of this. So, um, and then, you know, there's a Twitter I mentioned, yeah, and many others. So health intelligence is, is not just collection of traditional collection of information. You define the scope, it's, it's okay. You, did, you do collect and now you still don't know. So you have time, place, people, organization, that will go more deeper into into the problem and try to co connect more insights and information to to discover these patterns. Uh, it doesn't exist in the system today, and uh, my my proposition uh, is to treat health at least uh, the same way we treat military. So you have soldiers in the barracks, <coughs> cleaning barracks every whole day and night doing nothing, uh, but they're there just in case we have war one day. Uh, I don't think that we should, I mean, we can save in health if we discover this more of these patterns and save on this 80 to 90% that we'll, we spend on 10% of population. <laughs> so it's a different paradigm. Um, and so, so maybe, you know, we, we need more investment in health. Actually, actually not maybe, that's so obvious. I mean, I, I know, I know your profiles and how, how much you expose, but if there is financing today, it's not sustainable. It's not there tomorrow. And um, again, th this is not hospitals, uh, although I noticed on the hospital level is the same. Uh, like in Switzerland, there's a Swiss personalized health network uh, that had significant uh, investment in, 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 as the name says, Swiss Personalized Health Network. But actually, if you read um, the rules to propose projects, um, you cannot propose a project that has a practical uh, application in healthcare. So it's actually Swiss Personalized Research Health Network. That would be the right name. So it has to be a research project. <laughs> I, I was shocked when I read it the first time. Um, we, we wrote a few proposals, um, but um, it's simply there is no support for practice. Uh, and I think it's a systemic problem. Uh, very few people, not enough investment, stressful uh, work by the nature of it. So um, there is no health intelligence. But without health intelligence, we don't have focus on all these concepts we're talking about here. Um, knowledge models on different other kind of analytics um, and this uh, different knowledge of different disciplines that needs to come together to, dis to, to reach out uh, towards these most impactful uh, uh, domains, which is these complex illnesses where you, you, you discover new things. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's basically what I wanted to say about health intelligence. So before jumping to the third part of the is always close to my heart, which is then the, the hopefully the answer to your question, Andrea, about <laughs> um, so how do we do this? Um, is there anything here that requires some discussion and quality question? Sure. 
Should we jump to the part three now? I think it's it's about time. I, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll spend just half an hour on this one, and then we'll have another half an hour to to talk, maybe notes future, about each other's project if you want. So I can tell you about uh, plans on, on my side of the world, <laughs> uh, definitely, but uh, yeah. Okay, so part three. It has a strange name. I said solution, but yeah, it's it's uh, implying with with uh, with with the name for the part three what we need to think about when we think about solution. So so okay, it was it was easy to say. Okay, we, I, we identified gaps, challenges. It's really complex uh, using the paradigm we have today in the system. It's really not possible. One cannot blame. Uh, seriously, I mean, as I said, I revealed the secret, so it's my personal story. I haven't met and met so many doctors so all over the globe. Not a single bad person. They, they're all the same. I mean, knowledge is there, everything, but the system is making it difficult for all of us. Um, and so, what we do have is practically speaking, interoperability obstacles. We know the system is compartmentalized. We know that for many reasons, uh, um, data, information, insights, and knowledge, each one of the four and all four together are not readily available. Uh, uh, for many reasons, some are valid. Uh, in many ways, we simplified solutions uh, and then therefore we lost some capabilities we could otherwise have if we Take more complex and provide more support for some things that need we need as well. But it's we can say that without solving interoperability problem, we cannot have a practical solution. No chance. Um, and I think we can group interoperability obstacles in three groups. We know that all these different information systems, data sets, all that we use technology for, I mean, all, they're all developed using different technologies. Um, information in these places are stored in different formats. You have these tables, relational models, you have documents, you have whatever you have. You have flat files, CSV files, you have this semi-structured XML and whatever. So this is what we have. <laughs> and information is described using different terminologies uh, to make it more complex, also languages, right? <coughs> So I think you, you, you saw it there. So I, I like to, to talk about this this way. So what's the solution? Simple, right? We, we harmonize and unify. We unify the technologies. We decide to use the same technology, all of us, globally. We unify formats. We say, okay, we define which kind of problems are encoded or stored in tables, in, in, you know, um, files, in, 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 in graphs and whatnot. And we harmonize terminologies, right? We agree to use the same terminology. Well, I, I, I guess I, I should not spend more time on talking why this is not possible. I mean, I, maybe I can mention for those who are not too much into technology. Um, so you are a given hospital, you're WHO, you're European Commission, you have your tender, you have some, the cheapest, because that's usually the only criteria you have. Um, the one wins, and uh, these people don't have incentives to reuse existing technologies and components and add some small part to it. They have all investment to build something new that will cost that much. These days, there's no way we can break. I mean, we lose all the time in the world on that. I think we don't need to think that way. That's not, we can solve this problem different ways. Unifying formats, <coughs> I mean, it's also for the same reasons. That's maybe easier to solve, but again, people have different opinions, and us IT guys are deciding the names of the columns and whatnot. And you know, normalization or denormalization of relational models. You know, there is no the best solution. There is circum it's circumstantial decisions. So again, it'll stay there. Harmonized terminologies. I think in one word or in one sentence, it's a Babylonian problem. It's described in all books. I mean. People will continue using the same terminologies. Um, 
when I said this uh, last week uh, on the meetings with member states of the European economic area and uh, Hera and the TINA project, um, a lady from Finnish Ministry of Health asked me, how do you fit uh, what I'm going to show you next with um, ongoing, I think she said, three years initiative called EU for Health, where uh, they have a great idea that on the ministries of health, they will define terminologies. I, I told her my personal opinion, uh, actually from experience, I told her whatever she agrees on that level, whenever, in 50 years from now, 500 years from now, five days from now, uh, good luck if you manage to make all the labs in Finland using the same terminology. I mean, it's practically not possible. You sh we should not stop people. So if I don't have a name, I need to ask somebody to give me a name. And just give it a name to go on, go with my research or go with what I need to do. So it's, it's just a normal thing. And I think we need to live with this, with these characteristics of life. And can we find solution and still let people use their terminologies? And, and this actually starts implying that's, that's uh, what, what the solution where, in which domain solution would be. So how can we make information interoperable and reusable? So I'll start implying fair, but I'm not saying findable, accessible. For now, it's interoperable and reusable. Um, so, so here's one helicopter view, or, or from the moon point of view, uh, on on the information architecture. So, at the bottom end, you have this different kind of a data formats in different information sources, HTML, XML, CSV, uh, a given table, document, some database management system. Uh, how about we leave information where it is? All these systems are useful for those who are using them and they will not have time and you know, it's that will be boiling the ocean to say, okay guys, now you transform your systems and unify them in whichever way. Um, let them use it and let them annotate their information and you know transform or map from whichever format they have into graph data graphs um, and ask them if they want to annotate also using their knowledge models contrary vocabulary studies hours ontologies however they want to do it um, there can be people who just will create some some knowledge models like that, like we have today. Actually, arguably, all these knowledge models will belong to this layer here. And so this layer can, or these ontologies, if they're ontologies, or knowledge models are application ontologies, or application knowledge models. Why application? Because these are applications here. And people are deciding by themselves. So uh, AAA principle, which for those who knows, this old uh, RFCs for the web, we defined in, in one of the RFCs, I think, I can't remember which one. Um, this is web slogan. Anyone can say anything about any topic. This is actually what free web means. With this free web, this this slogan actually uh, is responsible for having this network effect and now everything is on the web. Uh, I was the first one, frankly. I admit in 1993 we started having internet operators or web operators I really seriously didn't know who will be that crazy to spin off a web server, to put some ugly looking page or text that nobody cares about. Who cares what I'm gonna put there? I seriously didn't see it, see it running. I mean, <laughs> now we're all, now Zoom is on the web. So we have this network effect because there is no constraints. I decide to link what I wanna link. I call it the name I wanna call it. And yeah, I decide to lie to you. So I say to my kid, my younger daughter, uh, she starts going to the web. Uh, I try to explain. This is what the web is. If you want to know, go, you need to. You get some hint there. Go read a book. You can be misled deliberately. You can be misled because people are biased and will try to prove their point. You can get great information. You never know. But this is the media is made for that. Media is not made for exchanging knowledge or not. Of course, can we use it to exchange knowledge? Not yet. So this way doesn't work. So so. ICD-11 is not complete when it comes to these all hazards and, and uh, um, all that might be needed by uh, somebody who, ne who, who makes a decision. Uh, neither is Nomad City. Uh, of course, uh, fire is a generic thing. Uh, 
neither is Loink, neither is any of these ontologies, and, 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 and neither can any of ontologies be, ever. So, but can we still have a network? Can we, can we connect this somehow? So one way, possible way, is to also have this connected layer of open reference domain ontologies, which will be ontologies of universals. Um, so, you know, if that's a simple example, I was using public health, so I don't know some molecule, but for example, anti, anti GED has maybe 30, 40 names differently coded. And, and you know, we, we deliberately have semantic web exactly because of AAA slogan. You know, all these tools are built, you know, uh, with uh, not assuming, so non unique name assumption is there. So you can have the same name for different things or different names for the same thing. All, all allows for that RDF, RDFS, uh, and all the tools, deliberately so, to follow AAA, so that you don't constrain people. And so, uh, this is one idea. But then of course, this is now centralized. So you would say, what's the difference now? Where, where, where does that sit? Where open reference ontology is devised? So the idea is actually to do it this way. Um, of course, it needs to be, it needs to be um, governed somewhere. But the idea is to still have AAA principle, meaning that, um, for example, I have these documents and I want to share some information from the document. So I'm, I'm annotating my documents uh, using my control vocabularies, my, my, my knowledge models of, of a kind I want, using names I want. But in my interest is that, that, I'm far, that my information is found and accessed. So in my interest is that this layer exists. And so um, imagine that this layer exists to a certain level. If I have, for example, uh, the name for SARS-CoV-2 virus that is causing COVID-19, for example, I called it historically NCOV. That was really one of the names we used at the beginning. So I will, I will, democratically, I will say, so in my, uh, in my knowledge model, there is a relationship, um, uh, there is a property same as, object property, same as if I use O, SARS-CoV-2, which is written here. Um, then I want to share some other thing, information about some other thing, but then I can't find it here. So what do I do? So this governance group, uh, we should also be experts, governance group, to the point that experts needs to be involved in making sure that the integrity of this knowledge model is okay. Uh, I'm requesting them to do it. Now my colleagues from ICD-11 would say, yeah, we'll have this pro we have this process for ICD-11. They established it in WHO, so you can actually send a request to introduce relationship, even change, or put some new note. And I think they meet every six months. But the problem is that it's a small group. Here, the idea is that this is, this is on a global level and, and, and it's really democratization. So like, you know, they can change like International League Against Epilepsy and whatnot, they can change there. Um, and, and it needs to be staffed in a way that is led by experts um, who have interest, of course, to, to improve this interconnectivity of data information, insights and knowledge. So maybe that's now, that now sounds like a boiling the ocean, just, just to finish the whole, whole solution. Then when you build your semantic AI application, then when, when, you're, when, you're doing, when you're searching web of data, now, now this is web of data, that's semantic web. Now when you're searching web of data, of using web of data search engine, for example, that we don't have yet, um, you're actually searching for universals and then that gives you access to all these different names and particulars. Why? Because these people connected these two universes. So it's not imposing, it's democratic way. I'm connecting, I have interest to, to share with you. It's not there. I request, we need to build on a global level for health, this entity. I mean, one can say it's not only for health, but health is so important that hopefully people will agree. And... <coughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll actually say it now I, I, because I'm, I think I have it in few slides after this, which is a mistake. I should have it immediately now. But so we had bigger problem than this one 
uh, in telecommunications. Uh, and actually, that's exactly where I come from. I was lucky one. I was working on that problem. But problem was from a physical layer, uh, technology is used to exchange information. So for those who are computer scientists or telco engineers, it was circuit switch and packet switch networks. Uh, uh, these different um, services are physically disconnected. Landline was physically dif disconnected from mobile, physically from internet, physically from satellite, physically from radio, physical radio broadcast, physically from TV broadcast, all phys completely disconnected and variety of, of network and transport technologies. And, um, and so what we did uh, in the mobile network arena coinciding for with with defining standards or recommendations for 3G we created something that we called third generation 3G partnership project and there so it was separate entity young engineers employed uh, led by governments and later on the strongest players in the private sector like my Ericsson where I worked and so the idea was to break the silos. A simple solution that took us just a couple of years was network convergence. There we decided to have all packet switch, so all IP, which you have now, which was important for us. We, we pushed for that because of the vision to have this mobile internet. Um, it took us more than 10 years, or it took all of us in the private sector more than 10 years to agree to have implementation of data communication protocols the same way. So now you have a mobility. Now you have no idea that you have had a handover from Ericsson antenna or, or base station to Nokia base station to um, Alcatel-Lucent base station and so on. It was not possible uh, before beginning of 2000. So so that's that's actually what uh, what we managed to do there. We have positive experience. It's a painful process. Uh, and we have similar situation in, in now IT services world. Uh, I call it Highlander principle. If, if you remember this Highlander people who are living forever and they're trying to kill each other, cut their head and only one remains. So it can be only one. This is what cloud providers are doing. So uh, actually this cannot work now. <laughs> this is not yet solution without putting the biggest cloud providers, Google, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, together in this room, like we did for telecommunications, and um, let them help them to work together before they realize that the business model of sharing is better for them than current business model. The current business model is that if my application is on Azure, and this guy here is not AWS, when they query it, when the data starts going out of AWS cloud, this guy is going to start paying. So, so you can put data in the cloud. That's cheap. That's that's for free. If you want to take it out of AWS, if you want to take it out of Azure, if you, you, you who own who is paying for that service is going to pay for that data going out. So, so actually, this is not yet a solution. It cannot be without solving it we can sit and wait for somebody to be Highlander, which probably will be out. No, never. Or maybe we can use the good experience. It was much more difficult problem. It was really <laughs> from a physical layer to including data layer there. So so that's my proposal, Andrea. I don't know if I answered your question, but I don't know a better way. It, uh, well, that yeah, I can. Yeah, so the arc, it has to be on a on a on a, on a public level. So so the, the the those who initiated creation of this partnership project in telecommunications were states, and I, I guess it was clear to them because telecommunication is a strategic thing for every 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 state. That's that was simple, but I'm here arguing so is health. So um, what <laughs> what I did propose, but I definitely didn't understand me there. Uh, uh, not yet. Leadership. By leadership, I mean Mike Ryan and guys on my level, so executive director of WHO, the operational guys, not Tedros, he's on different levels. Um, 
there are different vested interests probably. Um, they don't know about these best practices. They're not thinking about that way. But I think that organization, not people who lead the organization, but the organization is, is well placed to, to start this initiative or a couple of strongest member states. Say if, if US, Canada, UK, Germany and France come together and propose, I don't think that people will not follow. Uh, so so that, that, that actually happened in telecommunications. And, and then, then it's a process. But if somebody has, not now, any, any time, <laughs> better idea, give me a shout. <laughs> I know it sounds like utopia, but actually it's not because we did it in telecommunications. That's my argument. Yeah, the discussion space. But not. Do you want to leave it for discussions? Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 go down to the architecture quickly, and then we have discussions in a few minutes. So, so we just park this, and then then come back to this. So, um, so just to connect now the dots that we we had before. So, so we said these these people here just want to share. So. What they can do is to, to prepare, to create these virtual layers on top of their existing systems. Not, no, no change in the system, just new layers. To expose their information in linked data APIs, if we can call it that way, so using linked data principles. Again, we're talking about semantic web technologies here. We're talking about web to make data findable and accessible. Um, and they're still disconnected now. Again, sorry for not having colors here, but so they will be still be disconnected. Um, and anyone can see anything about any topic. So they describe things in a different way using different names and so on. And then, um, then we have, I said, these universals. So then we have interconnected data sets. Um, what I was actually trying, what, what we're trying to build some pilots, the actual web of data search engine without search engine behind, but just to show people. So this is complex, right? And we don't have ontologies. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it'll happen maybe in 50 years <laughs> if, we, if we start working hard. But we can share data catalogs. You have a couple of control vocabularies, uh, W3C, like DCAT and, and uh, void. So for non-linked data, data catalog, void if you have linked data. Um, so you can share, you know, s metadata. So you can already put your data catalog of your data set in the web of data. And then the web of data search engine can find based on what you put in the catalog, right? So it's an RDF. It's a turtle file if you put it in turtle. Any, anyway. So we can go step by step slowly to introduce people into that. Um, that was one experience with... Uh, when I was talking about these exactly things last Monday in, in Brussels, um, um, Norway um, uh, cares a lot about chemical, radiological, biological, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear uh, threats, information about these threats, especially now with the war in Ukraine. They consider that as, as national security information. Uh, and they don't want to share, they're very resistant to share anything about their surveillance systems and their systems, information systems or, or information sources within Norway when it comes to health, especially that domain. <laughs> and then when we talked about benefits, uh, the meeting ended that uh, the same lady who told me how this is sensitive, she had an idea to have a pilot. <laughs> And she has, obviously she cares about this data uh, and maybe if we can show that we can use this in annotation and discover patterns um, using, for example, pattern recognition and historical data like Chernobyl in 1984. Uh, and she has all that. So, so you know, like you, you, can, you can bring people coming to realize, wait a second, maybe, you know, if we, if we can really demonstrate, you know, this works, then people will follow. We had the same idea in WHO with one project trying to do some pilots for early detection, early warning and alerting system um, for detection of new unexpected, unusual events. Um, and, and, you know, we came up with some crazy 
quick uh, scenario where we're not detecting disease, we're detecting mass gathering that we didn't know will happen during the disease outbreak. So we're detecting hazard before it manifests into manifestation of disease. So um, this is one way how we can get people, again, uh, I said I'll go quickly, not discuss, I start discussing, so I'll stop myself now and leave more time for discussion. But um, some people, people have a feeling they're perceptive to having pilot projects, proof of concepts. And frankly, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I propose tutorial and not to propose proof of concept here. But I think this kind of group of people and in, in your organizations, you can reach out to different public with maybe if, of course, you have capacity or, or together in building this proof of concept. So take one small scope and show the stakeholders potential that this has in it. And maybe that can actually help, you know, building this consensus and stronger community that can move through this partnership project or whatever else better way it has is, is there. So um, so you can have some pilot or deference domain ontology universes. I mean the example that comes to mind is schema.org. It's it's not exactly what they have in mind. It's much more complex here, but the concept exists. These these guys in the private sector came up with, you know, let's have a, a group and you know put in the GitHub and you send a pull request for a new relationship or new concept in schema.org and you have it there and there. All three, four, five companies are using it. So, so the same concept here. Um, I will not dwell on details here. I mean, it's it's clear. And then you have health intelligence applications, and here we we can discover we discover these patterns from this connected interconnected data sets that might be useful and maybe have some universal meaning or not, and then share with the others. Because I'm an engineer, just quickly. <laughs> so. Um, Here is different things that you might find in legacy systems right now. This is a legacy data management, you know, typical. This is a file system with CSV, with some indexed text. Uh, if you if have uh, text search engine, I put here e uh, EHR, uh, assumption it's some relational database management system. Here, if you write with data, you have some XML files, you have some web servers, maybe web pages, HTML, whatnot. And then uh, this, is, this is what you have today. On the upper layer, you have some web server, usually it's all web applications, and that's it. So you don't change it, you leave it as it is, and then you build two layers. One is linked data integration layer. So this is how, how, how you build these red, red dots. So obviously, data, linked data integration layer where you can have RDF converter, I mean, back and forth. I mean, I'm saying nothing new here. This is, this is conceptual architecture anyway. Um, but this is a proposal for these stakeholders. So this is what you need to do to build this virtualization layer. So this transformation or mapping layer is here. You can have ontology service. The point is that ontologies are open, obviously, right? So others can understand what, what your annotations mean. You have parsers and serializers here. And for example, you know, reusable components that already exist like R to RML and things like that. And, um, and then upper layer is Linked data graph, really, really, or, or, or linked uh, data API, if you want, of different kinds. So you can have things in file system, you can have serialized information in, in files, different formats, and triple squads, and three turtle, RDF, XML, JSON LD. Um, and you see, I put here data catalog as well. And of course, that can be accessed through web server. Um, I mean, each one of these documents have a URI, and then within you also have RDF format. Uh, or you can maybe decide to put things in your in the RDF store and then expose sparkling points upstream. So this I usually use as a first kind of uh, information to those people who are asking us how, what to do on this level. Um, I, th I guess here on, in this room, this is, this is an overhead, you know that already. But um, but these are the red dots. So the point being, so I, I would like to finish with that. The point being is is that um, with people feel free continue using what they use. It's useful for them. That's why they use it. 
just ask them to put this virtualization layer. And don't bother, just annotate however you want. Just put it in this linked data format so it can theoretically be accessed. And then if you want to share, you need to connect with universally. You need to in, have in your um, uh, knowledge model that relationship defined, that object property that interlinks with another um, uh, knowledge model which is stored in some other remote system, which in this case will be that universe. So that's the idea. Then, then you know, why that? Because otherwise we'll, ha we'll have the same problem as today, have the central authority and then we have the same interoperability problem. People will not be able to comply or if they want, they will just wait and then their system will be less useful. I think this is... Yeah, so um, I'm coming to an end. So <clears throat> basically, there's one other aspect that we need to think about here uh, to be able sure that to, to, to be able to make sure that that we empower actually uh, patients and their doctors. Uh, so we need to change the paradigm. Actually, today's paradigm is that uh, data custodians of my data are people in hospitals, and they really don't consult with me. They make they make rules. They make decisions and. Uh, I think it's just natural that they are on the careful side. So basically, pretty much system disabled or make extremely difficult to share. So we need actually to break out of this. Uh, I even had to had to um, uh, correct people uh, many many times when they say it's my data or our own data. Doctor says it's my data or I don't know. It's no no you're not. I mean you're somebody else's. So um, we, we, if, if we have this, then people will share. If we don't have this, it will be difficult to share. So simply, you know, people need to be empowered. And this digital sovereignty, I thought it's another buzzword until I found uh, the purpose of it. <laughs> so the purpose is really to, to, to empower, to have rules that, that enables individuals, communities, nations, so different levels, of course, to, um, to have a control over their health data. So nations and Communities cannot have their health data, it's only individuals, but... Um, and then freedom to manage it they want. Uh, I got one question once a long time ago, but yes, what about people that cannot do it? Then, you know, they will be in danger that their privacy is breached. But then my, my question is, what about these people? How do they decide about medication they take? Somebody decides for them, so it's the same here. Some people will not care, which is okay, they don't care, so they won't share or whatever. So it's... Again, I, I don't see any, any other way we can practically go if we don't have this democratization in terms of, uh, or, or, or sovereignty on, on individual level as well. So we need to change these rules. We need to have proper thinking about solution for consent, taking everything into consideration. And uh, what I would like to have into consideration is less thought now for some reason, but it's really patient-driven data management. So protection, I decide what I want to protect where, when, and I decide what I want to share to whom, when, and the implementations for that exist. The problem is, for example, in Switzerland, um, there is a patient data from different places and hospitals, but only PDF files, <laughs> so it's, it's useless. My kid has 5,000 odd PDF files, and you have no idea what's in there, so whatever you share, it's useless. Um, but, but this kind of a decision that I want to share with you, and I can name uh, individuals, doctors, whom I don't want to share with, specifically, or during a certain period of time, I share now, they don't want to share. So these principles are already implemented in some applications, so I don't think it's a, doesn't sound like rocket science. Many are resisting, but I think, you know, this is, this is the only way. And, and then collaboration, uh, this sounds like heresy even today. Um, <clears throat> And I, I'm using public health here, rapid risk assessment. What I mean is this alert to patients and to doctors um, based on the results of analytics. Simple case, I said, just counting, 15,000 seizures. And you haven't seen a patient who has 15,000 seizures since, since you've seen it last. That should be alert all over the hospital. But the system doesn't work that way. That, there's no KPI. There is no nothing you know, when it comes to that. So it sounds like a change in the system, which it is. 
and uh, even even more heretic review and comment on consultation reports. So when we do something, when we publish something, when we publish reports in the industry, we have we asking our colleagues to review it, taking comments into account to make sure that the quality of the document is as best as possible. When you go to the doctor, the doctor understands you some way, doctor writes, and believe me, more often than not, it's not really fully accurate what's in the case report. And then you say, we need to do NLP and to take facts from the from consultation reports. Well, good luck. Who knows what's there? Uh, so how about patient being part of, with the doctor, you know, at least reviewing? Of course, again, not making doctor working on his report like 15 weeks, but again, make put put the person in the loop to the best of the person's capacity to have the quality best possible. So. So here is something I think that also is part of the solution that is less thought of and, and, and has to be taken care of. I, you probably noticed I haven't mentioned security in any particular way because I just assume it. This is just a normal thing when it comes to IT. I mean, data protection, I have security on IT level, network level, and everything else. I mean, of course, this is part of the solution. That's, uh, and so just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll stay on, on, the, on the partnership project level, but you need to have this governance on each one of the levels, local and the hospital. Uh, so arguably you can have, uh, you have this governance, uh, patient-driven data protection, I'm suggesting. Um, expert data governance for knowledge models, at least. Um, open source program office, I, I think this is also the only way that we can, we can break the silos. I mean, if people should be interested in health, and you know we should be open for meaningful and organized collaboration. This is not as simple as it's simple to write these four words here, but I actually I found it open source program office in WHO because I needed it in my projects, which are knowledge representation reasoning. Um, it's possible <laughs> to do it. The fact is that they're not doing it now the right way is another another problem. But I think this is this is these open innovations where the public is involved could bring benefits. It just needs to be properly managed and governed. And then application development, all these applications that we have today. Don't want to name them, you know them. But again, there are these reusable components, ontology design, web of data in terms of APIs and all these architectures, advanced analytics or personalization. So it's not never one algorithm, it's it's a workflow. So we need to have the, the kind of a platform for, you know, from exploratory data analysis to feature engineering to feature data store to version controlled model stores separately from algorithm, library, orchestrator, um, continuous benchmarking in production, things like that to make it really, to engineer it, to make it work. So this is something that somebody needs to have. And then domain agnostic applications like risk assessments or normal detection, recommender systems, you name it. And some domain specific applications, reusable components. So, so this is in an ideal way how these activities of interdisciplinary teams. Uh, I'll skip this one, but this I mentioned. And uh, now the same on national level or international, like European Commission, um, WHO, and whatnot. And this partnership project that I mentioned. So, so with the partnership project. Um, there is a standardization part, actually, where, you know, we need to agree on these different components. And we, for example, need to agree with the public sec uh, private sector, for example, to break the silos and maybe, you know, work on their business models to, to uh, allow uh, for connectivity between their cloud systems, for example, and so on. Uh, and with that, I, I exhausted uh, all the topics. So we have 15 minutes or a few minutes more if you want. I'm, I'm fine. Uh, one question about uh, the layers uh, of the ontology that you showed. So you showed the the application ontologies that uh, are more local or people are using to share the data. And then on top of that, the open reference domain ontologies. Uh, and I was wondering a bit what would be the difference between those two ontologies. Couldn't you just use the open reference domain ontologies 
uh, on your own data and that that we already uh, in one step the goal yeah absolutely i mean ideally it will be just one but uh, imagine the case that so, so so this is slow um life is here so when something is missing there you have two options one option is don't wait for them have your information coming here build or improve your system annotate for future and then request them from them to basically create or propose what they should include which universal so that's the reason why this thing should be between the two and why this these two should exist uh, to make it more efficient so uh, the AAA principle is kept here well the simple answer is no actually i don't think it should be there um, because then again that will slow down the whole thing um, the the whole network can maybe help you know discovering some inconsistencies using network analytics and and then point to inconsistencies or point to disagreements so again anyone can see anything about any topic is is the principle um so um your your first question was how is that um, this is very slow here and clicking but it doesn't so this this red dots uh, should be considered So the, I, I don't know what to, I don't know Dutch I don't know what this means but um, anyway uh, the, this these red dots are basically APIs it's I, I like to call it linked data API the, these are you know like the, these red dots are either these graphs are either stored serialized here in this any of these RDF formats or you know you have an RDF store triple store and, and you have sparkling points either or so basically these are APIs and and then the structure is the structure you believe is right for you and it might be completely wrong but that's that's what you believe is right and it's on me to query it I'll find something I need and I'll take the neighboring stuff or explore and and then then it's a nice semantic AI application to disagree or to say well it's useless or you know, so I'll do exploratory analysis obviously when I start finding what you want to share and uh, problem a little bit more efficient than current data profiling when you <laughs> approach a new data set um, which is less thought of you know I mean every, every time I work with external partners uh, projects uh, I specify every time requirement that um, not not data exploration or, or landscape analysis or data analysis data profiling so you 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 take a dictionary or discover whatever it, so you you know theoretically what's possible to be put in a data set maybe you have a data model as well so I have an idea how they implemented data integrity and consistency rules but it's still not enough. I need to see what's in there really to know exactly, you know, how it looks like. So I need to do profiling, I need to do exploratory data analysis. So it's inevitable as well in these data graphs. I mean, you know, it's not just ontology, it's not just vocabulary, it's also data. What do you really have? So I don't think that, you know, people, if it's useful for them, it probably works. It's, it's in some domain okay. So that's the assumption here. Swiss Personalized Health Network. No, it's uh, it's it's giving money for infrastructure projects between five university hospitals in Switzerland. All that way, but I am trying to abstract it uh, in a crowd one. I I I can't wait to. I'm I'm gonna make sure that I'm there on their presentation. They have there's somebody from SPHN talking about it. I'm really curious to to know exactly what's how they see now because they're talking about ontologies they're talking about interconnectivity yeah but what I what I've seen so far is if I remember well quickly going through websites so I might miss many things um we're going to use nomad to annotate but you can't there's so many things missing there so you're keeping the same problem if you know like how, how can I break out I want to share my daughter's data with anyone in the world because actually it's her only chance these kind of patients I can't wait for Snowman CT she's gone 
So I want to share, I'll annotate it my way, I'll expose it in the API, and I'm going to ask these guys there to connect it. And it's a new part in the vocabulary. And then maybe nobody will find me. But if I'm going to wait on SPHN, you know, the slower countries in Switzerland, I mean, my country in the region is slower. <laughs> or, or like World Wide Web, uh, crazy, no, no, I, I want to name names. I need to bite my tongue several times because I have names. <laughs> some of these people become somebody else and then just because they want to do it because they don't want anymore to socialize or SPHN or in Switzerland they had a red button I guess they were inspired they said taster did this red um, reset reset taster <laughs> so the same people who are blocking this for you know I talked to them in 2010 about this uh, a few years ago they have reset taster which is a new PR but I have no idea that it's not an idea. It's still eminence-based, you know, we'll do it on national level. How about do it on local? I, I want to do it in my hospital. I just do it. And the next month, we'll do it like, I just want to have my web page on the web server because I'm crazy, I don't know, in 1993. And so the same way. And, and then if network, if critical mass start doing it, you have your network effect. Then nobody needs to tell anyone to do it. It'll just work. So that's, that's how I see those that. That at least we get point. I systematically failed for the last sixteen years. Everything it's right failed. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know what what I didn't try is to create a patient organization and then patient uh, patients in University Hospital Geneva and then we go together. <laughs> that I didn't try alone. It didn't work. Like I'm a crazy one, but. But, you know, can somehow those who are interested put the pressure? I actually tried with doctors, you know, and they you need to work more with them on that. So I, I, I plan to call some of them to uh, Applied Machine Learning Days is this workshop. So I have two days workshop. First day, the same topic, just with practicals. Uh, first day is public health uh, kind of scenario. And second day is the same, but just with eight. Well, this is actually a patient that me is They sold it. They sold it some time ago. But it's 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 not that. It's sharing documents again. So they they share their yeah. But that was organized by by um, that guy whose brother died of what's the name of when your muscles are. I forgot the name of the English. His brother died. He he was incentivized and he started that. And yeah, it was. But it's sharing of the documents. It's still not helping uh, connecting connecting this information that we need in this little. What about you? Have an you the doesn't incent. You take connected. Yeah. So I was I was what I was thinking of is. Um, because of, of current situation I have is <clears throat> very, very openly, frank, frankly speaking, I, um, uh, I found myself engaging as a consultant now for, which is nerve-wracking if you ask me, <laughs> working with these big organizations. It seems like perpetual, but it's always like there is no stability uh, in a real way. Uh, so now, because of here a project and entity data consortium, what they offered me subcontracting, and I could not find simple way for me like freelancers. With so it's not possible to do consultancy. So I will definitely create this association, which is non-profit, Social Impact, uh, which I actually proposed guys in WHO on the top to spin off because they're slow. So I thought to spin off. Um, the projects I had, which is not listed here, were sponsored by USCDC and Rockefeller Foundation. I, I, I don't trust, especially not these foundations. It's, it's not sustainable, this investment. But, you know, exploring, for example, they're all revolving around these big organizations. And I suspect this is, not be this is because they don't really care about global good. It's more about having, you know, WHO logo and we are, you know, funding WHO and whatnot. Um, but I'm going to try to test them because I know them by now. Um, so this is one way. But then you want to say 
well, you want to stay as independent as possible, learning lessons from WHO, for example, <laughs> which is completely non-independent. 83% of BNU uh, budget is from private sector. Uh, you can see it in it's a public information. <laughs> so when Bill and Linda Gates uh, want to have a polio program, you have polio program. You don't have something else. And then you don't have any more polio program because that's gone for them. So this is, this is how it works on the global level. So you can stay independent if you can find a way to engage in this expert way, pilots, building for hospitals, and things like that. Uh, and now I sound like entrepreneur and this is not my intention. <laughs> But I, I uh, no, what other initiatives exist? I don't know. Everybody is revolving around eminence based. Everybody's trying to find a place, including me. So the proposal is to create a partnership project, health intelligence partnership project, which we will be led by Tedros, by WHO, co chaired by Hera DG and Minister of Health of Germany and UK and Japan. So you let them do what they do, but they're not operational. If you wait, then you will all die. Um, and then you operationalize. So some, some operational, like, a quicker independent entity uh, employs people there with the help of these eminence-based donors. And then you do exactly the same as we did in telecommunications slowly. Sir? That's still my idea. Because of the situation, I mean, the organization, the association will be there, but just, of course, I'm rushing now because of engagement with Hera, Tina. This is the only reason. Uh, but now when I created, it's association, it's non-profit, so it can easily raise the, the attention. So maybe, you know, next step. You know, I, I was interested. I, I proposed this tutorial and all these workshops. Uh, I mean, I started being invited in these conferences. Actually, they inspired me, guys from Pacific Rim International Conference. So AI called me, and and then I asked them why are you calling me. I said, "Well, oh, you're talking about solution all the time. Everybody's talking about theory." And then I was thinking, "Okay, maybe I should use the just inspiration. Maybe I should try this year to tell people like you one possible solution, because I do believe that it's it's coming from here." Definitely doesn't come from top down. It, it's no no chance. As you said, from hospital, what's their incentive? Tell us me the about that. Depending where you occupy, yeah, exactly. But all, all this eminence based, uh, you know, hierarchy based, strong, big organizations are not moving. No. Yeah, yeah, it's a business. And here's the point, it's not business, health is not business. So we should try to, I don't know. Exactly. But I think it's probably who pays, not. But that who pays will need this. He will, he will be ill and he will be then saying, well, maybe I should. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's vested interest of different kinds. Uh, these guys and strategize are calling it social jobs. You know, when you so what's your priority? This thing to build a system or to be good in your peers' eyes or you know superiors' eyes or whatever. So we all have these priorities, and let's not lie ourselves. I mean, more often than not, we put the social jobs as higher priority than the other, right? And it's normal. The same as these leaders, you know. So my last discussion with one of our assistant director generals was really interesting. He Referring to all this, he said, yeah, it's great, visual, but you, you, you're not patient. You need to be more patient with us. We need, you need to give us more time. And he, he explained it like he's really in pain. <laughs> and I, for a couple of years now, I, I don't use any diplomatic language anymore. My, my answer was, how can you? I mean, if, you, if it's difficult, go do something else. This is health. And really, on, on top level, this top political international level, there's in so much pain, so difficult. We need to wait. Give us more time. Be patient. Well, we should have started the past few days the incentive. Yeah, they do. They do. Like donors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, and can't fight it with them, so. Yeah. 
So anyway, um, here's some conferences here. There will be a challenge, a couple of challenges actually. They asked me this extended semantic web conference that will be in Crete. I actually have to quickly to put it on the website <laughs> you know, next week. Um, is that him or please tell me? Uh, give me, give me, give me, give me a week. Uh, it, it has to be on the website of, of that actually text to knowledge graph uh, workshop, I think, within the conference. And they asked me to put the child. It'll be three. Uh, and I forgot what's the third one. <laughs> one is related to healthcare, another one is related to public health. Uh, and I forgot what's the third one, probably something ontology with it. Yeah, if you're interested. Take uh, thanks. Yeah, we top of the hour. Is there um, any more uh, questions or comments here on the meeting? If we want. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So it's it's. it's Thank you. Thank you.